All right. We are live. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't begin to tell you how devastating this topic truly is when you consider its depth. So I'll say out the gate, I wanted to play a clip from Game of Thrones. There's a moment where a witch, witch doctor, witch whatever, believes in magic, like blood magic, uh, the idea that a life is going to be given as a sacrifice to the gods to somehow prosper the people so they'll survive through a struggling time. And Dr. Kip Davis plays this clip in his lecture, which is down in the description of this video. If you don't watch that and feel like honestly destroying the people who are doing this to this young girl, then I don't see how you have any humanity in you. So imagining the idea of human sacrifice and going into antiquity, trying to understand how intense this was, you may want to watch that clip. I mean, it's next level. Before we do that, let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to have Dr. Kip Davis join us here in a minute. We may have Dr. Joshua Bowen as well pop in. Both PhDs, experts in the field of Hebrew Bible and Dead Sea Scrolls, and they know the language, they know the context, they know the ancient Near Eastern context. This is nothing surprising to them, but it might be for those who are tuning in. We are myth vision. The human sacrifice that we've seen develop over human history, it's not unique. It's not just the ancient Israelites. Yes, I say that. The ancient Israelites practiced this. This is the stuff your apologist isn't going to tell you. They're not interested in that. But I suspect this is stuff that Marcion himself saw in the second century and said, there's no way. This is the God of Jesus. This God that is represented here is archaic, Bronze Age, and is something of an antique that I hope remains antique. I wish people would recognize that. But either way, I'm introducing Dr. Kip Davis. Welcome to Myth Vision, my friend. You're muted. <laughs> I said it's good to be here. It's good to see you. That is a hell of a hat. Thanks, bro. So I love it. Um, I'm not. I'm not a brave enough man to wear it, but uh, but it looks it looks amazing. Just amazing. Well, I, I hope so. I mean, we got we got to try and distract them from how heavy of a topic this is. No, seriously though, I watched that video that you did and. Um, Episode nine, season five, my good friend Abdullah Samir actually posted a clip of me talking about what happened with Jethro's daughter. And apologists like to go around, oh no, she just became a temple priestess, so to speak, and saved her virginity. Like there's always an excuse from what actually happened. And yeah, it's there, it's not pretty. There is. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why I'm I'm pretty I'm I'm pretty passionate about this uh this particular topic and i think one of the reasons is we know the story of jephthah's daughter we know the story of um uh the akada of abraham's sacrifice of isaac we know these things these are these are quite uh popular stories they're well known um and the, it, it's easy enough i suppose for an apologist to to wiggle their way around them in an effort to say okay yes Human sacrifice, child sacrifice was a real thing. But this is not something that 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 God designed. This is not something you always wanted. Look, you know, he was he was like goaded into it, or he had no choice in the case of Jephthah's daughter. Um, 
with Isaac. There was never any intention to sacrifice him in the first place. So, you know, we're off the hook. It, it's, it's condemned in mm. uh, other passages by, by Yahweh himself. He says, I never, uh, I never asked for human sacrifices. I don't want it. I mean, how much more clear can you be? Well, the truth of the matter is that the, the issue is complicated. It's, it's a complicated situation because there are echoes throughout the Hebrew Bible of a time when human sacrifice, child sacrifice appears to have been something that was normative in some respect. And these are not human or child sacrifices made to the other gods, the gods of the nations. These are human child sacrifices made to to Yahweh. Mm. And it's something that certainly at, a, at, at various points in the history of uh, Israel and Judah in the writing and the editing of the Hebrew Bible is something that the authors and the editors were grappling with. They were, they were, you know, obviously repulsed by the practice at some point and felt it necessary to essentially scrub it out of the text and yet we have remnants of a practice that seems like it was clearly um a part of the religious ritual at a time in israel's history so i I, if if i may jab in while we're doing this we're going to go into some of the context of these passages and reveal some of this so people are aware and can say this refer to this video If some apologist is telling you that that's not the case or it's not there, there's no fossil record in the Hebrew Bible of human sacrifice, child sacrifice, etc. You may want to refer to these experts. Constellation Pegasus, thanks for the super chat, my friend. Passing through the fire in Rashi, commentary meaning or means walking between two fires in some circumstances. Confusing. Also, Marcion saw sacrifices. So my comment on Marcion is simply he's looking at the Hebrew Bible. He sees the brimstone and justice of God. He doesn't see a loving God. He sees an absolute pure justice God, if I'm not mistaken. And it looks almost like an evil God. Um, One can dispute in John 8, you are of your father, the devil. In Greek, that could easily be interpreted in David Litwa recently. Dr. Litwa I talked to even said, he's like, it's more easily translated as you are of the father of the devil. And the idea is that the creator is the father of Satan and that this is the Old Testament God. So it's not yeah. ridiculous to think Marcion saw this and said, whoever this Johannine redactor or editor, or if you will, this author, whoever this guy is, is saying no to that. And we have uh, the God of Jesus, which is a different God. But anyway, would you like to comment on that particular passage or particular the, idea? Uh- the the idea that um, that Marcion saw the God of the Hebrew Bible or of the Old Testament as a monster is 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 that what we're we're well he we're mentioned the passing through the fires of Rashi I don't know if you know much about oh that. oh um, Rashi Rashi was a was a Jewish commentator and um, y- yeah so what I think what uh, Sorry, I, I wasn't looking at the super chat. Sorry, guys. Um, what he's, <laughs> I, I think, what he's getting at here. Yeah, yeah. Here it is. I got it. Um, means walking between. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this is this is just uh, indicative of what what Jews in the medieval period are are, are trying to do with difficult texts. Um, Rashi, uh, a brilliant commentator um, on the Hebrew Bible was doing what apologists always do which is attempting to massage to harmonize to to um um to scrub what whatever's happening in the text to make it more palatable to make it uh obviously um more acceptable within uh within within uh the contemporary period um so i I thought um, we might as well just get right into this, eh, Derek? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. We were going to ease you guys oh. in onto the altar yourselves and then secretly slide the blade in, but 
we might as well just tell you what we're about to do. And anyway, so I have a, um, I have, I, a number of years ago, I, I did a whole online course, um, on the religion of the old Testament, the, the, uh, the religion of the ancient Israelites. And I have uploaded all of those lectures to YouTube. Some of them you can't see because they've been copyright ID'd and, and DMCA'd. Um, we wanted to show the scene from Game of Thrones that, that Derek mentioned uh, from Season 5, Episode 9, which depicts a, uh, a horrific uh, child yeah. sacrifice just because it it's so repulsive and it's so visceral. I think we, we, we get in our minds, we, we, we can read the text on the page. We can, we can imagine what this was like and, and, you know, how these things happen. But, but this is a really, really, um, it's a, it's, it's, it's shocking and, and it's, and it's, it's, it's kind of gross. But it's. I think it's I can important tell you, for it, people to it see tore and me to understand. Up. It tore me up so, watching that. Yeah, we're not going to show that because I, I mean one one of the reasons is because uh, it's going to get it's going to get uh, snagged by the good people at HBO. Um, you can go see it though, because uh, it's it's in it's in my uh, it's in my lecture video on uh, I think it's Temple of Ritual. It might be uh, the seventh video in my series. And I go through and I, I, I talk in depth about uh, the theory of sacrifice, what sorts of sacrifices were performed. There it is. Yeah, I do uh, not what sorts of hit sacrifices? Play, but... No. What sorts of sacrifices were performed in ancient Israel and why and under what conditions? And in the last 20 minutes of that video, I do a presentation on child sacrifice and human sacrifice as we can we can see it in uh the remnants of it within the hebrew bible so what i thought we would do today uh i'd encourage everyone to go and watch that lecture anyways um you should watch the uh the scenes in there from game of thrones because i think they they help to contextualize this quite well but what i thought we would do today is i'll just go through the uh the slide presentation i have and we'll we'll talk through it systematically um the the bit of my lecture on child sacrifice in the hebrew bible okay so kip real quick before we actually get to that i've got some super chats i need to address for my friends who help support me to do what i do and Absolutely. then um we can get into your presentation but i also want to introduce him to your channel so nikolai thank you so much for the super chat my friend he says what about ezekiel 2026 20, where god himself says we're going to get into this by the way this is a great super chat i defiled them making them offer by fire all their firstborn that i might horrify them i mean we're going to get into that i know that's one of the passages Unfortunately, it's actually not one of the ones I was planning on talking about, but I think it's it's emblematic. This is a, a perfect example of one of the problems when it comes to dealing with this topic in the Hebrew Bible is that there are a variety of voices mm -hmm. coming from a variety of times, from a variety of, of places in their way of addressing uh, the idea of, of child sacrifice or human sacrifice. And the Ezekiel 20 passage shows, I think, pretty clearly uh, the notion that uh, within the culture, this was accepted as normative practice. This was accepted as something that, yes, in our history, Yahweh did. Yahweh wanted. He says as much to the prophet Ezekiel. Mm. You have some more there, Derek. Yes, yes. So, all right. Mystic Dog, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. He says, just sending love. Uh, he, she, I, I'm not sure who. I, I just say he. Sorry. Mystic Dog, thank you for the love. I appreciate you are those, supporting us and helping us out. those American so, so. dollars? <laughs> 20 American dollars? American, yes. Wow. Yeah, you're I in Canada. I know. A, it's a little. That's a week's worth of groceries for me. <laughs> Wow. Thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate it. 
Constellation Pegasus says, how about a video on Heath Durrell's book, Child Sacrifice, Ancient e Israel? It's a difficult read. Haven't finished it yet. Have you read that? I haven't read that one, actually, no. But I feel mm. like I should. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much for the super chats. Real quick, before we get yours up, I want everyone to know, go subscribe to Dr. Kip Davis' channel. It is an excellent channel, full of insight. He has that that video. It's down in the description. I put the link itself separate so you can watch that Game of Thrones uh, intro that will literally make you crawl on your skin and absolutely want to take a sword to defend this young girl. Um, and you can see the mindset that would probably be around a sacrifice like this and how the emotions of a family member and such would be. Also, Dr. Josh might pop in. I want you guys to go subscribe Digital Hammurabi. It's a sister channel to ours. Love everything he stands for, what he does, and trying to educate people. And he also has the book, The Atheist Handbook, which I have right here in person. Everybody get you a copy of it. It's also down in the description. I really hope you guys it's go really check good. out Dr. Josh. And also the Patreon. I can't tell you how much work I'm doing. I put six, seven, eight videos sometimes in a day that are on there for every one video you see on YouTube. I mean, sometimes I have a few days break while I'm editing or recording or whatever. Go check that out. There's tons of content that I keep dropping, new stuff every time I turn around. The recent stuff with Dr. Richard Carrier and Dennis R. McDonald uh, is really fantastic. So appreciate the support. Dr. Kip, I'm going to go ahead and add yours to the stream. We're not trying to play this part, right? No, we're not. I'm... Uh... I'll remove uh, that for I'm now. Just then. Gonna... <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay. I dropped that. I'll just go ahead and share my own screen. Entire screen. Yes. Go ahead. Dr. Okay. Kip. Thank you for the love, everybody. All right. Dr. Kip. So. All right. I hope everyone can see this. Does it look good? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So to start, um, I just want to uh, start by providing just a very basic thumbnail sketch overview in a few sentences about what, what sacrifice was in the ancient Near East, in ancient Israel, how it was thought to work, and why. So um, there's, a, there's a whole section in the actual lecture where I talk about in a little bit more depth a, a theory of sacrifice. And um, sacrifice, it, it, it's a word that's become really very much neutered within our language, within the English language. We talk about uh, sacrificing a meal so that we can, we can pay, uh, I don't know, an unexpected bill or, or to get ourselves something nice. We, uh, we for when when for those of us who who were religious or still are religious will make uh, uh, sacrifices in holidays such as in uh, in Lent, and I think this has conditioned our thinking a little bit in terms of what it means for sacrifice, and it colors the way that we might uh, read texts from antiquity or imagine the practice from antiquity. Uh, sacrifice in our in our modern way of thinking really has very little to do with the actual practice itself and its function. So uh, right from the outset, in the most primitive point of the uh, the enactment of sacrifices in religion, this was all about nourishment and appeasement of the gods. In the ancient Near East, the gods required care to ensure that their attention could remain fixed on the important task at hand of maintaining cosmic order and keeping the chaotic forces, the, the forces of chaos, the, the monsters like Tihamat and Rahav, at bay. So this is something that people in antiquity imagined was part of what was most of what the gods were doing all the time and mm. they required food and sustenance in order to keep it going. And this is where the idea of sacrifice probably originated. It was about ensuring that the gods were fed 
sustained uh, so that they could continue going about doing their jobs. So sacrifices or food offerings were generally thought of as food for the gods, provisions to sustain their presence, their favor, and the smooth operation of the cosmos. And in particular, if you're uh, living in ancient Israel or if you're living in one of the surrounding Canaanite nations such as Moab or Edom or, or uh, Phoenicia or Samaria, um, and you've got your own tribal, your own local deity, it's also about ensuring that they're happy and they're on your side. So this, this is the idea of, of what sacrifice was and where it came from. It evolved considerably. It became much more ritualistic and symbolic uh, in many respects. And I'm not going to get into that here, but I think it's important background for what we're going to get into. Okay. So. so technically the gods need to be fed from as far back as you can go. This is a way of feeding the gods. Yeah. And I think I'll, I'll say this too. I think I mentioned this to you when we were chatting earlier today. Um, something to, to keep in mind and to imagine here is uh, just in terms of how the, the language, the Hebrew language works. Um, we're one of the, the expressions when in, uh, places like uh, the Holiness Code in Leviticus or in the uh, the Covenant Code in Exodus, when speaking of sacrifices, uh, an expression uh, appears with some frequency where, Yah where, where Yahweh says um, that sa the, the sacrifices go up as a pleasing aroma. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a picture at work here in the mind's of the ancients that's connected to this idea of, of food and, and sustenance for the gods. Um, the way I like to, the, the way I like to show it is, is that the Hebrew word translated as nose as your sniffer is off. And this is also the same word or, or one of the words used uh, for wrath, for the fierce anger of Yahweh. And there's a, there's an obvious connection here between the anger of Yahweh and 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 his nose and his his olfactory um, powers that uh, is directly connected to the idea of sacrifice as the animal or the grain is 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 burning away on the altar. The smoke is going up, and in the imagination of the offerers and the priests and those presents, you can kind of see. Yahweh just kind of sitting there and going, ah, yes, that smells good. This is what I like. This is, this is chilling me out. I'm not as angry and triggered as I was a few minutes ago. So this is, this is kind of the picture of what's going on here. Okay. <laughs> So that was heavy. <laughs> Should we pause? Do we need anyway. some? Do we need some time for reflection? I need a safe space right now. I need definite safe space. <laughs> okay. just, just kidding. Um, yeah, let's 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 go ahead and dig into this, right? I mean, okay. I think that's pretty crystal clear. And we do have a few Christian apologists in the chat that are asking. They're like, "Are you open to have a, an apologist come on and talk?" You know. And I said, "Look, just stick around. When we're done here, we might actually allow one one in the room and have a conversation. Sure. Um, I would be happy to have that. In fact, it would be interesting to see how they will get around everything you present today to try and paint God." In a modern perspective, I mean, remember, slavery is not really slavery. It's indentured servitude. God's not really, you know, doing this and that. That's the typical thing we get. So, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to see how they respond to you being a Ph.D. You know the Hebrew. You know this stuff. You know the language. You dig into the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know the Hebrew Bible. Maybe Dr. Josh will pop in as well. I'd love to see an apologist come on here. I wouldn't care if it was William Lane Craig. It could be anyone on earth that's an apologist i'd be happy to see them come in here so all right and it's not it's not just a language issue we're dealing with here too i think it's important to point out that this is a um this is an editing issue uh with an and a, and a source issue with 
in in respect to what's going on in the Hebrew Bible. Because remember, as I mentioned, we're dealing with several layers of tradition, which is why you're going to get, um, in in most cases, nothing more than echoes of an ancient practice, but then also uh, obvious invectives against it. So there's a like there's a dynamic picture of what's happening here. So just to start here, we have uh, there were actually uh, there were two kings in the Hebrew Bible who offered uh, child sacrifice. Uh, Manasseh sacrificed his firstborn son in Second Kings chapter twenty one verse six, and Ahaz uh, sacrificed his son in Second Kings chapter sixteen verse three. And they were both severely censured for it. Within the text, this practice is condemned in these places. And again, this is this is part of what I'm getting into. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the authors, the editors of the Hebrew Bible were absolutely uh, a number of them were repulsed by uh, by this uh, in uh, in several places in the text. Uh, a, a place called Tophet. Is is mentioned as uh, as a location where uh, child sacrifices occurred regularly, and likewise, it's heavily criticized in the Hebrew Bible. We see this, uh, for example, in in Jeremiah seven uh, thirty one to thirty two. Um, I'm not going to get you to read this, and I'm not going to read this, but we are going to to take a closer look at a, at a few passages at some point here so be ready if you for need that. Me to pull I, one up too let me know i'll just yeah um well actually so maybe yeah we're gonna get into one here in just a minute so maybe just put your finger on second kings chapter 3 verse 26 for now and uh, we'll get there in a few minutes okay chapter 3 all right you said there it is on the screen chapter 3 26 okay. to 27 the term mulch or molech in the Hebrew Bible is often um, suggested as the name of a deity that uh, demanded uh, child sacrifice, which was likewise uh, heavily condemned in the Hebrew Bible. The, the thinking now uh, tends to be that this is n not likely a name for a specific uh, deity, but more likely um, a term that was used for a typical or a sort of ritual practice that it was the passing the children through the fire that was identified as mulch or or malach um, that was was under censure or uh, condemnation so we're going to look here just for a second at uh, an incident in second kings chapter 3 verses uh, 26 to 27 and this is a story of uh, the king uh, Misha, who goes to war with, uh, uh, I believe it's it's the uh, the Judahites, and um, the battle starts to turn for him. Uh, things start to get bad. He he starts to um, lose, and King Misha panics in this story and is is uh, desperate. To, to win the battle, and in response, um, decides that he's got no choice but to offer his son as a sacrifice. If you could just read chapter 3, verse 26 to 27 there, Derek. Okay, 26 to 27. And uh, we do have a super chat when you get a chance. When the king of Moab realized he was losing the battle, he and 700 swordsmen tried to break through and attack the king of Edom, but they failed. So he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him up as a burnt sacrifice on the wall. There was an outburst of divine anger against Israel. So they, break off, they broke off the attack and returned to their homeland. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll we'll let's let's take a look at the super chat after we finish dealing with uh, with this passage here. No but um, there's a the and I had said it was Israel. It was actually an alliance between Israel and Edom that Misha was uh, was fighting against. So 
what's happening here is, as I said, the battle started to turn. In response, he offers his firstborn son as a sacrifice. And then what does the text say at that point, Derek? It's very interesting, I think. After he offers his son as a sacrifice. After he offers his son as a sacrifice on the wall, there was an outburst of divine yeah. anger against Israel. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think is happening here? Sounds like God's not happy with him doing this to his son. Or, and this is, I mean, there's a, there's a number of the, the language is difficult in this passage. And that is one interpretation that God, and, and I've heard uh, apologists suggest Yahweh in this case is, is angry about the fact that, that a, a child sacrifice has occurred, but the result of it is that the battle ends in a stalemate and everybody goes home, which is kind of odd. And I'm going to suggest to you that what's actually going on here is that this is an efficacious act. And what I mean by that is it looks like Misha's sacrifice worked. It looks like the sacrifice itself, because uh, remember, he's at the point here where he's about to lose. He offers the sacrifice. It says that the wrath of, of the God was affected. And we're not sure which God here, whether it is Yahweh or whether it is Kamosh. If it's Kamosh, then, you know, what's happening is the... Uh, Kamosh is so affected by this sacrifice that, that he turns around and actually comes through for Mesha so that he doesn't, at the very least, lose the battle and that he's not defeated. You hmm. see what I'm getting at here? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, even though, even though this is a text where the sacri a child sacrifice is not celebrated, it's certainly a point in the text where we can see it seems to have worked. Whatever it was that the ancients believed was part of this ritual, it they also clearly, whether they thought it was disgusting or gross or, or wicked or whatever, they also appeared to think that it worked. And I mm. think that on its own is something that uh, that we should find maybe a little disturbing. So yeah. we're going to sit on that for a minute, get to uh, a super chat or two if, if you need to, and then we'll okay. move on. Super chat from Tyler. Uh, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Any thoughts on the archaeological records? I don't believe there's any archaeological evidence for child human sacrifice. We know that the Aztecs for sure, but we're talking ancient Israel. So, did the Canaanites, is there, arche and you're not an archaeologist, so this no. is not the best, but is there? So right. here's the problem. Um, just by nature of, of the materials, uh, it's very, very difficult to actually identify um, s sites themselves or, or remnants of uh, the practice of human sacrifice from the period we're talking about because everything was burned up to a crisp, right? So there, there's no, there's, the evidence that we have for it tends to be uh, literary, uh, historical records of, uh, of places where, where people uh, saw human sacrifices. Um, it's, there's a, um, a Greek historian it might have been Herodotus. I'm probably going to get this wrong. Uh, who who writes of of watching human sacrifice in uh, in in Carthage, um, which was a which was a Phoenician settlement. And you know that's that's it's it's later than the period we're talking about. That is often pointed to as analogous to what tended to occur in other places throughout the ancient Near East. But there's certainly uh, pockets and and um, elements within the text that have survived from that period, as I'm mm. as I'm uh, walking us through, which 
indicate that this is something that happened and it's it was something that that was was relatively widespread this was a common um if not necessarily a common practice as in something that everybody did all the time uh certainly something that everybody was familiar with as as something that happened does that help thank you, thank you. does that answer yeah your i think so Hopefully and I, I think getting an archaeologist to talk about how would we know if it was human sacrifice or a battle, right? Like a battle breaks out yeah, or they die like or something that's, else. So it's that that's where it gets really, really difficult to try and interpret what's going on with uh, with the remains that you have, right? Especially so, if they're burnt. If it's a burnt sacrifice, exactly. I mean that's that's a whole exactly. nother are they burning the bones to ash because you do have a strange scene and it, I figured Second Kings thirty, I think it is thirty two. I, I can't really recall exactly, but they're like burning these enemies of Yahweh on altars. They're not children. These are like warriors that are like grown men that they're burning. We're going to get into all this stuff. So, okay. Next yeah, to the yeah. chat. Alan so, Bird. Oh, you want me to read this? No, go ahead. Read it. Alan Bird. Love you. Thank you so much for the super chat. Abraham is not shocked when he's told to sacrifice Isaac. Does this tell us how prevalent the idea of child sacrifice was? It's an interesting super chat. I, I mean, it's hard to, in many respects, it, it is also hard to gauge the uh, the emotive response of, uh, of of the participants from a story in some of these ancient texts too, right? right. So I think to be fair, we're not necessarily. Uh, I mean, you could make an argument. I'm not making this argument, but one could make the argument that we just don't know one way or the other with regards to Abraham. Certainly, the text does not specify what his reaction was. And he seems to just fairly systematically going about doing what he's told. It's kind of interesting. Um, I'm just going to, I have to pause to tell this story. Uh, there was a, uh, a TV series. I think it was like a six episode uh, TV series that was produced by, by Mark Burnett, who's the, the uh, creator and producer of survivor. This came out in, I think 2012, I was living in Norway with my family at the time, and it was a uh, it was like a six episode series about the Bible, and uh, like a dramatization. I think, yeah, I'm not sure if it was just the Old Testament or the Old and New Testament. I don't particularly remember, but I was actually I, I, I was watching uh, the first. It was, must have been the second episode with my with one of my sons, who at the time would have been. How old was he? He would have been eight, eight years old, I think. And it got to this story about uh, Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac. And the way that the directors depicted this was Abraham sitting there under a tree. And then all of a sudden, uh, there's no audible voice and there's no, you know, no um, physical presence of God obviously there. But he, he responds by going, what? What's that? There's voices. In, he doesn't say this, but it's like there's voices in his head. What's that, Yahweh? You want me to do what? What with my son? You want me to sacrifice him where? This is kind of the, the way this scene plays out, right? And I'm watching mm -hmm. this with my eight-year-old kid. And he just, he's, he's watching, and then he says to me, he goes, Dad. I said, yeah, Nick. And he goes, is that guy mad? And I said, yes. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> if you're hearing voices in your head, then yeah, you're probably mad. Oh, okay, good. Just wanted to know. So anyways. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> did you have another one there or should we move on? No, just Alan wanted to ask. I'm not thinking of Abraham as as a person, but the fact that the story is in yeah. the text with no disapproval expressed. So it's like the same thing I say with Jethro's daughter, which we're probably going to talk about. Just the idea is, I've said this before, and the apologists go, but God told him no. He didn't tell that yeah. to Jethro. In fact, he never yeah. said at any point, this is not approved, this is not okay. It's you know, it, it, he went through with it. Jephthah made the vow to God, and this is written, so it should have been somewhere in there where, and Yahweh said to Jephthah, no, we don't do that anymore, or that is not permitted, or that is yeah. not acceptable. So yeah. 
we'll get there. And as we will come to discover with Abraham, there is a case to be made that that sacrifice is actually one that that he followed through on to its completion. Right. We'll get to that in a minute. Oh, and I wanted to mention one other thing. Um, another, it's not on my slide here, but another uh, example of a human sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible occurs in 2 Kings chapter 23, when King Josiah um, <laughs> goes through his campaign of religious reforms, uh, which are all about centralizing the worship of Yahweh, in Jerusalem mm -hmm. so you can only worship Yahweh alone you can only worship Yahweh in the temple in Jerusalem and all other places of worship and sacrifice are eliminated and wiped out and part of that in part of that program Josiah actually goes to Bethel where there was a famous shrine uh, that was there for hundreds of years where, where people offered sacrifices to Yahweh. And what he does is it says he breaks down the altar. But before doing so, he takes all the priests there Sacrific at the shrine in Bethel. And he sacrifices them on the altar. And then it says he went to Samaria and did the exact same thing. So... You'll and this is like the, the head honcho, man. This is a guy is the who's like... He's the man with the plan. He's the righteous He's celebrated. one. Celebrated. Right. He is right. celebrated for this. And you'll so read remember, in your English translations. You'll read in your English translations something to the effect of Josiah slaughtered on the offer, on, on the altar all the priests who were there, or you know, he, he killed all the priests who were there. Please be clear, the word there used is sacrifice. Mm. he sacrificed them so but we have to move on here no i just want to say for those who love smashing people with the bible and you know who you are okay when you say you don't have a foundation for morals i don't think you do either so anyway please if you want to be if you want to use that kind of logic right the bible is my it teaches the look at what you got here now if you want to be like Condoning this kind of uh, activity, assuming you're right, and burning your enemies and sacrificing them to Yahweh, sure. Uh, go ahead and go back to the Bronze Age because we don't need you in 2021. You know what I mean? We don't want 2021. We don't need all that. Anyway, please. I'm and sorry are, for making that point. It, it's fine. But, I, you know, as a, I like to make the point to people, too, that uh, you, you know, we, like to, we like to sit and, and we like to read our Bibles in, in a 21st century uh, Western, modern Western context. But it's really important to note that these are really, really, really foreign texts. They're written in foreign languages. They come from a culture that is, that is practically unrecognizable to us today. And, and this is how, we, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird stuff going on here and i think it's important that we 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 recognize that and we we keep that in mind as we're uh, as we're reading the text so this is this is really the question i think was child sacrifice normative in israel i mean there's there is a universal tacit acknowledgement within the biblical text that that child sacrifices took place whether they took place exclusively within the surrounding nations or you know also took place in israel i know apologists are going to debate that scholars don't um and then whether or not this is something that was that 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 took place only um as offerings to other gods and not yahweh again uh, this is the question that, that we're looking to answer here. And in answering this question, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 22. And if I can right. get you, Derek, just to read Exodus chapter 22, verse 29. All right, let me bring that back up. Exodus 22, verse what? 29? 29. And just read verse 29 for now. We'll get to verse 30. Okay. In a and um, I will get to your super chat here uh, sometime in a bit, my friend, when we have an opportunity. Exodus twenty two twenty nine. Do not hold back offerings from your granaries or your vats. You must give me the firstborn 
of your sons. Yes. So, I mean, I think on the, on the face of it, it's pretty clear what's going on here. Do not hold back your offerings from your, your vats and your storehouses. Um, this is, these are your food offerings. Mm -hmm. um, and we tend to have no problem with understanding that part of the text as clearly about, you know, ensuring that you are, you are making enough and making appropriate sacrifices to Yahweh. But then the text continues and says, also, don't hold back your firstborn son. Give him to me. And a common apologetic response to this is that and i mean within the within the text itself um there's i don't have the reference handy here but there's i, I believe it's in deuteronomy um at you know a later point in time uh this particular passage is actually interpreted <laughs> reinterpreted by the biblical writers as you know well, this is not, it, the, the text makes it more explicit that this is really about uh, sending your son into service at the, at the tabernacle or into, into uh, religious service. Um, and it's, it's suggested that that's, that's sort of what's going on here, that this was, never, this was never intended as a physical sacrifice, but this was more of a metaphorical, well, just as, you know, you might sacrifice or offer for sacrifices, you know, grain and, and uh, oil. You, you, you know, symbolically uh, will take your firstborn son and, and send him to, uh, to work at the tabernacle. As Hannah did with, uh, with her son Samuel in uh, the book of 1 Samuel in the first couple of chapters there. So that's, that tends to be the argument here. But I think it's a more difficult argument to sustain when you finish the, uh, the passage off with uh, verse 30 there. All right, going back to verse 30. Let me pull that up here. And all right, back to verse 30. And it says, you must also do this for your oxen and for your sheep, seven days they remain with their mothers, but give them to me on the eighth day. So <laughs> what makes the most sense here? Does it make the most sense that um, the oxen and the sheep are also to be given to the tabernacle or to the temple in service? Whatever that means. I don't know. Or work at the does it make more <laughs> does it make more sense that this is an instruction to give cattle and sheep to the temple or the tabernacle as offerings? You know, something I would like to make just a note of on the seven days they stay with their mother on the eighth, give them to the Lord. I can imagine apologists going, don't you know, they get circumcised on the eighth yeah. day. And this yeah. might be their little loophole, right? But here, what doesn't add up? There's sheep and there's oxen. Are they circumcising the sheep and the oxen on the eighth day as well? One will try to anachronistically yeah. assume. I kind of wonder, and I'm throwing this to you, th then I can ask our super chat if you're okay with that. Um, yeah, sure. I'm kind of wondering if circumcision kind of replaces uh, a sacrifice in a way. Oh, if, it, if, it, yeah. if it fills in that gap. I think I think definitely like I th I think um, it's it certainly becomes a, a replacement at some point. But this is why why context is so important, because while we can maintain that, yes, at a period in Judah's history, they were very, very uncomfortable with with a passage like this, which is why. Uh, these, uh, these, these later interpretations started to, to become more prevalent, but mm -hmm. within the context of the passage itself, it's very difficult to single out that little bit about your firstborn son in the middle of instructions, explicit instructions about offering food and oil and, uh, cattle and sheep. So that's the point. 
Go ahead with your super chat. And that, oh, sorry, did I say your super chat? Super chat. <laughs> we, we don't want it. I am a super points. chat. It's all good. It's all good. Tyler, man, thanks again for the super chat. And he said he's a student, by the way, a PhD student on Hebrew Bible. So he's, he's nice not for everybody who might wonder mm. why his questions are this way. How do you it decide which stories happened and which are myths in these cases? Like, I, I, I mean, we all agree, like Abraham, right, did not exist. Yeah. But this narrative, you know, how do we distinguish? Now, according to Exodus and Deuteronomy and these things, uh, that that's not so much of like a historical text of a narrative, but pre, it's kind of prescripts, or if you will, giving you kind of like, here's what you're to do, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, and it's complicated and it's difficult. And I will say that um, distinguishing between what's what actually happened and what's myth is never as simple as just deciding or or taking a look at what the genre of the text is um you you can't just you can't just assign everything that appears as quote unquote historical narrative to actual history mm -hmm. um one of the one of the great difficulties of doing history and i'm talking about any history uh from antiquity using the texts that we have which have survived is that there are mythical elements to all of them you know this is a point that uh, i was on uh i was on a show with doug from pine creek recently and he and he made this point he's like but but dr kip someone's going to say oh that's greco-roman biography you know, it's a it's a genre that was used for for telling uh, history, for for telling a true story of actual people who lived. And then, yeah, that's true. But all of Greco-Roman biography is loaded with tons of mythology. It's the same. It's the same for the the Hebrew Bible texts, even those texts that that we feel more historically confident in such as those that take place in the so-called Deuteronomistic history in uh, Samuel and Kings. There's an awful lot of stuff in there that is, that has been uh, theologically uh, redacted and retold in such a way uh, that it's, it's in a way part of a larger uh, national myth of who Yahweh is, what, the kingship what the monarchy is about who israel is and 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 what they're doing so i'll just say you know i mean telling figuring what parts to accept as history both versus what parts to to assign as quote unquote myth is not an easy process and it's not one that's just based on on how texts were written there's an awful lot more that goes into it there's there's archaeology there's source crisis criticism there's uh the manuscript evidence that we have and unfortunately when it comes to the hebrew bible most of that evidence is very late uh and it's fragmentary so mm. yeah it's it's tough but uh good luck to you yeah i <laughs> mean student. what's his name um her name let me scroll back up here or, it is uh he goes by tyler uh husson h-u-s-o-n i'm bad with names luck. i know that Good luck to you in your studies, Tyler. Yeah. All right. Shall we move on to the Akedah? We shall. The Akedah, as it's commonly known, uh, and this is the word that, that means binding, is the famous story of uh, Abraham taking his, his firstborn son, Isaac, and offering him as a sacrifice uh, in accordance with what Yahweh has instructed him. Now, um, Sorry, I'm just finding my spot on the page here. So the Akedah in Genesis 22 is promoted as a dutiful performance of, uh, of child sacrifice. This is Abraham just doing as he was told. And it's set up in such a way where, you know, Yahweh comes and says, Oh, just testing you, just seeing how far you're going to go. I wasn't going to make you go all the way abraham but i just i just wanted to make sure that uh that you and i were on the same page this is this is what happens in the hebrew bible story abraham doesn't it also 
doesn't it also characterize the devotion? We were talking about how important your firstborn is. The first fruits of all your stuff, whether it's, yeah. you know, your grain, your animal, your children from the womb of your spouse, yeah. which you are one flesh with. Um, all of that, like this narrative, sure, he didn't have him sacrifice. He had him come almost to the point where he literally was going to kill him. And then goes, nope. In antiquity, this would have been seen as noble and something that oh, was yeah. like, wow, you actually were willing to do that. The way we look at this, the way our morals, if you will, have developed, the way we now look back and go, okay, if we took anything from it, it is commitment and devotion, I guess. But it's like, we like, why do we need that story? It's not the best. It's good to remember how we shouldn't do something like this. And really psychologically, like why you were talking about with your son, this is a no-go. Yeah. But the importance of a firstborn son is also, I think, the point. It is, it is very much so. And there's there's one more there's one more text that we're gonna look at after this one, which makes that explicit. Just about, you know, the value of these things and the amount of um the cost, really. Mm. The sacrifice itself was, you know, the the um these were these were not easy uh these were not easy things for, for these people to do. And we get this, I think we get this picture in our head too. And this is where I, I think it's important to actually watch that whole episode from Game of Thrones mm -hmm. uh, where Stannis uh, makes the decision to sacrifice his only child, Shireen. Um, one of the things I really like about that episode is it goes through and really explores what Stannis is experiencing. And how difficult this is for him and how much he is absolutely destroyed by this decision. Mm. Uh, you know, people in antiquity, when they made the choice to sacrifice their children, it wasn't a callous act. It wasn't like, oh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, in their minds, this was not uh, a reflection of their, um, of, of some limited small value that they placed on human life rather to the opposite you know the life of their own offspring was so important so massive that it uh, it really was was the ultimate expression of devotion um so but that's that's a very good point Derek, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I want to draw your attention here. We're not going to actually read the story because I think it's something that, that people know quite well. People are really familiar with it. But what most people probably aren't familiar with is the fact that there are alternative interpretations of the Akedah that have survived in later Jewish texts. Hmm. And some of these actually maintain that... Isaac was indeed killed. Let's look at this first one. <laughs> this is from Midrash oh, Lekatol. Let me, pull you up. let me pull you back up on the screen. All oh, right. sorry. Okay. I'll get your super chat in a minute, Tomic. Thank you so much for that super chat, though. We'll finish with the Akedah first. So let's look at this first one. This is from Midrash Lekatov. And it says, The God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac. So this is, a, this is an interpretation of this phrase um, within the uh, Hebrew Bible and what it means. And according to the Midrash, for Isaac was in the grip of fear as he lay bound on top of the altar and his soul flew out of him. And the Holy One, blessed be he, restored it to him by means of the dewdrops for resurrection of the dead. So mm. in this interpretation, in this later Jewish interpretation of the story, there appears to be a clear recognition that Isaac in fact died on the altar and then was <laughs> restored to life but we're not done i've got another one here so this is from uh midrash shibole haleket when father isaac was bound on the altar and reduced to ashes and his sacrificial dust was cast on mount moria the Holy One, blessed be he, immediately brought upon him dew and revived him. Blessed art thou, O Lord, 
who quickens the dead. So it's clear here, and these are these are these are medieval texts. It's clear that even as late as you know the the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, I don't know, uh, century CE, you've got Jewish communities committed to this idea that Abraham went through with it, that he was not stopped by Yahweh at the point of uh, decision before thrusting that knife into his son. No, that he actually completed the act, and Yahweh was so satisfied with that that he decided to um, miraculously restore Isaac to him. Mm. And I think this is this is we don't know for sure, but I think this is this is possibly reflective of an interpretive tradition, a very very old interpretive uh, interpretive tradition that that no longer survives to us today, in which Isaac was in fact sacrificed. And for all we know, this could be an even older uh, tradition than the one uh, in which Isaac was was rescued from death. Wow. Wow. Oh, Still man. Super yeah, got a couple of them, and we've got a special guest here joining us. Dr. Josh, what is up? I can't see so, you, guys. but it's good to see you, Josh. It's always yes, good to see Dr. Uh, Josh. I am. Probably can't stay for too terribly long. Got some work to get done, but just wanted to pop in and uh, say hey. I'm almost done, so. Yeah, no, I'm glad you did pop in, chat. I was just talking about your book at the beginning, too. Everybody needs to go get the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. Um, that book touches on some of this. But, it, you know, are you going to ever spend any uh, time delving into hu human sacrifice? We lost him. I think he had to bounce. Uh, um, it'd be cool to hear if he's going to do, like, round two of this book and actually go and do yeah. a whole chapter devoted to all of this uh, bloodthirsty stuff. So, all right, super chat. That would Let's be go impeccable. To the so this is a good question, uh, Kip. And uh, do you think the death of the Egyptian firstborn was a type of sacrifice? Here he is. He's back. Yeah, I, I would. I think, I think it's fair to, to um, interpret all of these sorts of things in, even though the the actual they're they're not couched in the specific sacrificial terms, uh, such as a lot or zavach um from the hebrew language i think there's certainly uh there's certainly the element the mindset at work there that uh human lives are required by yahweh by the gods um to affect some sorts of some sort of action so i would say i think it's a fair interpretation um you know in the same respect that uh a common understand a common way to approach the um um oh my mind's drawing a blank uh josh the um the um uh the ban the hebrew word for the ban why can't i think of oh, it harem. there we go thank you the harem. um we can we can understand this in those same in within the same mindset of uh of sacrifice sacrifice in antiquity I don't know. Do you have anything else to say about that, Josh? Or did you hear the question? Uh, no, I mean, I, I didn't. I don't know what happened. Uh, so do, you're fine. Do you think the death of the Egyptian that. firstborn was a type of sacrifice, Doctor Josh? Yeah, I mean, I see. I, now it kind of makes sense what you were saying. I mean, this idea of of harem, of this something being dedicated to the ban. Um. You know, it's not it's it's not primarily something of, of violence necessarily. Although, when it comes to you know humans and often livestock, it's it's how it uh, you know it's how it manifests itself. It means that this is being dedicated to the deity, um, and so when you dedicate something to the deity, oftentimes the life of it has to end, uh, and and so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that seeing it perhaps in that light, I'd have to think about it a 
a little bit. Mm. Um, but, but um, I mean, certainly this is where uh, when we see stuff in the book of Joshua, for example, you know, and, and even there in uh, in First Samuel 15, this dedication, putting everything under the ban. Um, this is why they're killed. It's because they're being dedicated to Yahweh. So yeah, I, I agree. And I get it. I get into this a little bit in the lecture that I give on sacrifice. Uh, something that's that's key to note here is that within the methodology, this is how things pass over from the mortal realm to the the divine realm. You have to kill it. So in in a sense that it's not the uh, if I understand what Josh is Josh is saying here, it's not the violence of the act that's really the emphasis here. It's the it's the fact that this is what you have to do to to move to move the dedicated object from this realm to the next realm. Is that good? Okay. Okay. So we okay. uh next super no, chat. Go right ahead. Here. Yep. What do you think or why do you think they invented a bloodthirsty god? And uh I think that's an interesting question to ask because mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think it was just like, this is just a bloodthirsty God and all other gods aren't like there's like every other God has a distaste for blood, but this one does. Why would they invent this one? Um, I, I don't think the word for invent is, is really a good one, so to speak, because these things have evolved. If you will, we talk about the origin of gods, me and Dr. Bowen, uh, I ask him and he, he talks about a book that talks about the development of like polytheism and how nature and giving its agency and there's power in nature beyond us and stuff. But the idea that gods want blood, what, what can you, can you guys comment on that? This is an interesting super chat. I'm just trying to see like, why do they require blood? Hmm. I, I haven't actually thought that much about it. Um, I don't know. Do you, I, I, I personally haven't, haven't, haven't read anything or, or, or thought much about, um, about the origination of, uh, of the elements themselves. I don't know if, if Josh has anything to say about it, but it's a, uh, it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, as far as, as far as origination is concerned, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, obviously, the things that pop to mind are, uh, you know, life. I think they realize very quickly is dependent upon the blood, and um, yeah, and and from a from a purification standpoint, uh, it's efficaciousness. It's obviously That's it's the a ritual. One, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, as, as far our... as origins, I'm not sure. Yeah, like yeah, it's it's a good point. Throughout the holiness code, it's the blood itself that is the purifying agent. Mm. But uh, interesting. Yeah, thank you for that. So super can chat. we move? Can we move on here? Yeah, where do you want me? Okay, so um, this is the last. Oh, okay. Yes. So you, I mean, you talked a little bit about uh, about Jephthah uh, and his daughter. Um, I don't really have a lot to say about it. I thought you covered it pretty well in your um, in your uh, um, appearance on uh, on the show. Whose show was that, by the way? Uh, my friend Abdullah Samir. He's a yeah. friendly ex Muslim, and uh, he caught a lot of crap for it because I don't know what it is with ex Muslim channels, but like. 90% of the audience is probably Christian because they love to see people come at Christian or come at uh, yeah. Islam, but sure. he's also yeah. an atheist. So it's like, right. he drops yeah. this and he's like, look at this. He even showed me like the statistics of how it flopped. It's like, they don't want to watch this stuff. They want to see me bash <laughs> Islam or talk about Islam. Yeah. And it's like, wow. You eh? know? Yeah. So no, you did a, you did a nice job with uh with the story of uh Jephthah's daughter i only i mention it here because i think it's a um Jephthah's reaction in in judges eleven thirty five, i think provides a sort of a, a a peek into um the psychology and into the uh the emotive response on the part of the offeree 
uh, who's put into this this terrible position of having to perform uh, a a child sacrifice, and just how again I can I I can't underemphasize this enough. Just how you know this is not this is not a callous. Um, this is not a callous act that, that these people haven't put a great deal of thought into. And it's not like they're, they're under any misconception about what's going on here and, and, and what their actions mean and what they're doing. Um, I think as, as, as repulsive and as horrible as these, these practices in antiquity were, it's important for us to realize that these were ordinary human beings who went through the same emotional process of you know losing a child yeah even to though pretend that it, it happened fact, at their own hand it's kind of interesting you say that because it's at least the same or um potentially even, even I, i'm not trying to say it's worse but i'm saying imagine without them like survival is a lot often especially if they're male according to antiquity and and the way that survival is yeah. like you're less likely yeah. to survive and your name to continue so everything's built on it it's like life or death in a way that that the depth that you're taking it is serious yeah D dr josh you're the it's reason a, it's an illustration of just total devastate like total desperation yeah, absolutely. And and I just want to let Dr. Josh know, you know, you're the reason I, I did the whole Jethfa thing. Because, like, I've heard the story, but I took the apologist approach for years. And I'd be like, no, she just, just dedicated to the temple. God would never let that happen. And you're like, nah, nah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. This is, I think this is... I was just gonna, sorry. I was just going to say um, two two things. One, I think just the difficulty with this topic is, and and Dr. Kippy mentioned it earlier on. Um, you know, try it's it's sort of like coming to this topic in the Hebrew Bible in the canonical form. I think is a lot like coming to monotheism, right? Because yes. what the editors and what the redactors are trying to do is they're trying to say yes, there is one God, right? We worship one God. There aren't. You know, it isn't. This, this sort of divine council. They're trying to move away from that idea. Yeah. And I'm thinking of places like Deuteronomy 32 in particular. But as yeah. you said, there are like echoes, there are remnants. It's, it's, it betrays what it was. And so when, you know, Heath Durrell said this up in Princeton, you know, I think said this, uh, you know, most aptly and certainly he wasn't the first, but you don't make laws against things people don't do. Right. Exactly. So, um, yes. I noticed that somebody in the side chat said, you know, well, sh show us, show us where uh, there was a law that commanded child sacrifice. And I don't think, um, I, I think that the, the final editors, uh, certainly there are places in Exodus that you can make that argument, but um, I think that the final redactors and the editors in the Hebrew Bible are going to great lengths to say you shouldn't, right? But the, the, the point of the discussion here is to say why why would yes. they do that and it's because exactly. israelite um society practiced this to yahweh the other thing is i i want to commend you for pointing out um how much jephthah gave up by sacrificing his baseball equipment because in your powerpoint <laughs> because yeah, losing <laughs> losing a, a baseball bat is it was a damn nice a bat. terrible dad joke I'm yeah, sorry. That was definitely bad. I'm like trying to You have track. to explain it now, Kip. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. This is the Hebrew <laughs> word for dog. This is this is the way in an antiquity uh, certainly unnamed children were identified. You were either Ben uh, Ben Yosef or Ben David or Bat Jephthah. Thanks, Josh. That's uh, Oh, that's God. helpful. <laughs> it's a terrible joke. <laughs> it was. It was. Well, that's okay. Um, it also we, tells you the mindset, too, guys. Just the point to say in today's context, if someone like a a girl crashes a car, or someone murders a female, let's use a really bad example here. Someone murders someone. We know them by name. Right now, we've got this thing going mm -hmm. viral in, in the United States. They're searching for the boyfriend who killed the girl, and we think. 
that he killed the girl. We have really good reason to think that he did. Um, and I, I don't even know the names. My wife is addicted to it right now. She's like stuck. But they know her name, right? I don't know any of their mm-hmm. names. But they know her name. Instead, this shows you the kind of uh, world they lived in when you're Jethfa's daughter. Yeah. Like, that's what's a fair the girl's point. name? What is her name? We don't yeah. know her name. She. Yeah. She's known as Jethfa's daughter. You know. There is an there's an interesting book out that's uh, Ronald Charles wrote it, and it's on. Um, I think it's the silencing of slave bodies. In, in early Christianity, something like that. Oh. But it's it, it does something similar to what Jennifer Glancy did about slavery in, in early Christianity in the New Testament church. And that is by looking at how the, the texts speak about in the narrative, slavery and, and slaves in particular in the slave body. And this sort of thing of how you mention someone in a narrative um, whether you use their name, where, how they're cast, how many words are used to describe them. All of these things um, are, are avenues and doorways into analyzing how people, uh, if they're putting these stories together, view um, the people, you know, in, those, in, for, in, in this case, in the, like that social class. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think these are really important to think, think about uh, from a narrative standpoint. You know, even though I probably come down on thinking that the Jephthah story is like a folk tale, mm-hmm. um, I think what it what it what it says uh, is that this is you know th- th- while this might have been a little shocking in that he gives this like hasty um, oath that he'll you know kill the first yeah. thing that comes out. You yeah. know, the idea that he would sacrifice his daughter is not, it's, it's not like we would say it today. Like, that would be absolutely crazy. They would just say, Don't, not the first thing that comes out, you know, do yeah. you know, something else. But at any rate, yeah. um, exactly. I think that's important to recognize. Yeah, that, no, that's that's good. I was gonna I was gonna mention too. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of work that's been done on uh, on uh, the the place of women, the role of women, uh, feminism. Uh, feminist criticism of the Hebrew Bible by by some tremendously good scholars such as uh, Susan Haddox or um, uh, a Dutch scholar that that not very many people are familiar with I don't think uh, Fokalein van de Kames I don't know if you've ever read any of her stuff Josh but uh, just do some some really tremendous stuff with with you know the portrayal of of women and what we can understand from that in the Hebrew Bible, but that's, that's an aside. I want to look at one more text here. Um, okay. And I asked, I asked, uh, I asked Derek about this earlier. Micah six, eight um, is a, is a famous, a famous campfire song for, for some of us who are, who are in our forties. Um, this is this is a song we used to sing around uh, in Bible camp. I don't know if you you're familiar with this one, Josh. He has shown me, oh man, uh, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly uh, with our God. Did you ever did you ever sing that one? Um, you know, I think you'd have to sing it for me to to I'm know. I'm not, not sure. going to sing it. No, I'm not. <laughs> I was I was gonna actually play. I found I found a version of it on on YouTube, and I was gonna play it, but but we're we're stressing a little bit about uh, about copyright ID claims. So yeah. no, I'm not going to sing it unless somebody like donate. Unless somebody maybe maybe if there's a a hundred dollars super chat out there, <laughs> I might do it for that. That would um, be. The- that would but be worth it. I'm not doing it for anything less than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but this is, I'm um, sure this is a song people, some people of a certain demographic when our audience will recognize. And what maybe we don't tend to recognize is that this, this is, this is in response to a question that's asked in, uh, in the beginning of, this passage and the question is this with what shall i approach yahweh 
what's an acceptable offering? What is an acceptable um, gift for the God? Do, do homage to God on high. Shall I approach him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Would Yahweh be pleased with thousands of rams, with myriads of streams of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, my own body, a sin offering for my life? And so that's the question. Are these, you know, shall I approach Yahweh with these things? The answer, the response is this. No, he has told you, O man, what is good and what Yahweh requires of you only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk modestly with your God. So I want to point out a couple things about this fa- this passage. In the first place, um, what, what uh, Dr. Josh helpfully pointed out uh, just a few minutes ago, these are the sorts of questions, these are the sorts of texts that you only write if you're, you know, writing a law against something that's being practiced. And in this case, if you are um, asking a question which uh, which has, uh, which presupposes these things as somehow normative. Yes, people approached Yahweh with burnt offerings. Yes, they approached him with calves a year old. Yes, they approached him with rams. And yes, they approached him with streams of oil. Yes, they approached him with their firstborn with their children as a sin offering for their lives. Mm. So that's the first thing. There's a second thing I want to point out here to notice the progression in this passage. It starts with what? Burnt offerings with a single. What verse is this? What verse is this exactly? This is Micah six verses six to eight. Six to eight. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. So it starts with a single count. A single okay, year old calf. It moves up. Thousands of rams are worth a hell of a lot more than a single year old ram. Myriads of streams of oil are worth a ton compared to a single calf. And what's at the top of this? If if this is a if this is a progression in valuation, what's at the top there? My firstborn son, my firstborn child, as an offering for uh, my own transgressions, as an offering for my life. So I think, yes, this is an indication that the, the this is something that people were familiar with in the first place. You know, the only way in which this this passage makes sense is if this is you know if if child sacrifice was part of this. This program of of sacrifices and offerings within antiquity, but I think just as importantly here too, you know, we see that this is a sacrifice of astonishing value, exceptional value. I mean, there's nothing that you could offer uh, that was more efficacious, more powerful. Uh, more valued than your firstborn child. Mm. I mean, in the story of uh, of King Mesha and uh, his battle with uh, the Edomites and the Israelites, this is this is an illustration. It's the absolute most valuable thing he could have offered to Kamosh, and it worked. So. Um, that's, that's the slide presentation I have, gentlemen. So I'm going to stop the screen share. Okay. I have a super chat I'd like to ask, and it's, uh, Mark Smith. And, uh, thank you for the super chat. He says, how about infant circumcision? Which I brought this up earlier, Mark. Uh, Don't know if you were there, but he says, I think it remains a type of blood sacrifice to our modern gods of medicine and beauty. Medically unnecessary infant foreskins are sold to make skin cream for aging women. I didn't know all that. Wow. That's I did not gross. know that. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. 
Thank you so much mm-hmm. for the super chat. But yeah, oh. we talked about how, and maybe Josh can t- uh, uh, tune into this with his own uh, thoughts. We talked about how in one of the Exodus passages, I think in Exodus 13 and Exodus 22, you see this like, they shall remain with their mother for seven days, and on the eighth day you give them to the Lord, for they are yeah. mine, right? Um, clearly giving them to the Lord, and someone might go, well, that's circumcision, because we know that on the eighth day a Jew is sac- uh, circumcised, but are they going to circumcise the sheep and the the bull or the, the cow? No, they're not doing that. So it only works if you do that only for the human, but you can sacrifice the animal and they'll act like that's out of the question. But I wonder if circumcision replaced uh, the human sacrifice or infant sacrifice. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Josh? Yeah, I haven't I haven't looked into that um, from that particular angle. I know obviously there are scholars um that would argue that those two passages exodus 13 and 22 um actually don't don't refer to uh, child sacrifice um or at least weren't interpreted that way and mm-hmm. uh, obviously there are others that that do um and I, I tend to think at least at least the text in its uh, original formation probably did refer to that um but you know, I I'd have to read through all the secondary literature on those particular passages to to come up with any sort of um, you know more nuanced answer than that. But as far as circumcision is concerned, maybe it, maybe it morphed into that. But yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it. Interesting. I just threw it out there. I'm not saying I think that's what it is. I'm just saying it's it's on the eighth day, and if this is infant sacrifice on the eighth day as well for firstborn sons. It just seems uh, quite coincidental that the same day is the day you, cir- you you would circumcise. If that passage is referring to what we think it might be referring to, which makes a lot of sense. Mystic Dog, thank you for the super chat. Micah six eight has been a mantra of mine for years. I never saw the child sacrifice context. Thank you, Doctor Kip. Yeah, he it's kind of like. Uh huh. Yeah, he knows, he knows it. it. Nobody and nobody super chatted that hundred. They. They didn't want to. It wasn't worth him hearing you sing it. Is the point? They're, it's, they're not it interested. really isn't worth hearing me sing it. <laughs> it's not. Oh, thank you so much, man, um, Doctor Josh. I was asking you before um, God kicked you out of our stream because I know He was mm. not wanting this to go down. We didn't sacrifice right. any um, infants before this episode, and I was like, He's probably not happy with what's going on here. But um, your book, the Atheist Handbook, you're going to be doing a part two. Are you going to devote any specific like chapters to this topic in any of your upcoming The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament and talking about human or infant sacrifice? Um, no, but it, there is a hefty section in book one about it. Um, actually, in chapter three in the archaeology chapter, uh, okay. the, two, the two test cases that I use to show how archaeology works – is a talk about the Philistines and when the Philistines archaeologically show up uh, in Palestine. And uh, we look at like Mycenaean 3C, uh, 3C1B, I think is what it is, um, layers and other material culture aspects um, to just, you know, sort of show here's, here's how archaeologists do this. But then I also looked at um, child sacrifice and what archaeological evidence do we have for it. You know, how most of it comes from the seventh through the second centuries uh, mm-hmm. BCE, so obviously much mm-hmm. later than um, you know what we would need to see uh, to to sort of hold to this mantra of you know the, the you know the Middle Bronze Age um, Canaanites were these horrible, wicked people and needed to be killed. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I so I I, I do talk about it uh, at some length um, in chapter three. But uh, am, is, am I? Am I? Am I? Do I amuse you? No, no, it's, no, it's not you. Don't you. Understand. It's not, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, it's on. I think I'm, you said the Canaanites or the Philistines. Both. Okay, so you go to so that. I, I, have, I have a. Yeah, so chap, chapter three opens with it's all about archaeology. Each chapter, each volume will have a chapter about archaeology. So chapter three of the first volume opens with how archaeology works in general then it talks about biblical archaeology and how biblical archaeology developed uh, over time and then it has two test cases 
Um, oh, wow. One okay. is when did the Philistines show up in right. uh, the mm-hmm. land of Canaan? And then the second is uh, what's yeah. the evidence that we have for a child sacrifice um, in uh, in Canaanite culture? Well, uh, you, I just so. Uh, Oh, go ahead. I'm gonna delay no, I... this as long as I can here, man. But I was, hey, Josh, can you can you just comment briefly on on the difficulty uh, of doing of the the difficulty presented uh, from archaeology, Bronze Age, Iron Age archaeology, and in actually identifying uh, human and child sacrifice from the period. I'm like, I'm sure you probably touch on that, right? I haven't got to that point. Yeah, in the book yet. I mean, as, as far as as far as child sacrifice is concerned, because children's bones are, and I'm not a you know an osteop, but an osteopath, yeah. I think that's the one that does bones. Um, uh, you know, so I, I don't have any expertise in this, but as I understand, the children's bones are still quite uh, different than you know mm-hmm. adult bones, so they're mostly made mm-hmm. of cartilage, uh, which I think deteriorates pretty quickly in just open bear regular burials. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the what we would expect to see uh, if the Canaanites carried through on the customs that we see in Carthage, um, you know, Phoenician colony, um, then we would expect to see them buried in small jars, perhaps. Uh, and so the, the hmm. question, so here's, here's the problem. If somebody's going to make the claim, and this is what I talk about in the book, if somebody's going to make the claim that uh, the Canaanites were these wicked people who were always sacrificing children. If they're going to make that claim, you can't just say, well, the Hebrew Bible says so, right? That's not sufficient sure. as far as academia is yeah. concerned. You can't write a paper and say the Hebrew Bible says so, therefore it's true. You have to be able to say. You can probably publish is, something like that in IBR, though. <laughs> Sorry, no. that, was a, that was an inside uh, joke. There, there are there are a few places that you could get something like that, but um, yeah. but no. So so what you can't do, and this is what I tried to point out in the chapter, is we don't have people always talk about how we've got, you know, all these these pictures, or I don't even know where like it's this iconography or statues of bronze bulls and holding it, and it's like these are much much later right so let's let's actually look at what evidence we have archaeologically yeah. for child sacrifice here it is it's incredibly minimal um but yeah. what we have in the textual record seems to indicate that not only were the israelites doing it uh but they weren't strictly doing it to like baal or chemosh or you know some other deity or yeah uh, but they were doing it for yahweh the yahweh yeah mm. yeah we should also I, I guess we should get this over with eh? you know look yeah. dr kip dr josh didn't know this i guess but um maybe you did were you in here when he bet he was like someone sent a hundred dollars yeah you were in here send a hundred dollars and i had yeah, to send and I just saw it on the screen yeah. thanks josh yeah. that's what we were laughing sorry, at sorry. we weren't laughing at oh. you yeah yeah no. i got it now i gotta i need a stiffer drink after this <laughs> all right we're getting a zoom so. in on dr kip here all Boom. right it is your time to shine, brother. Oh, God. All right. So this is the song. You guys ready? And you guys got to mute yourselves because you're going to you're gonna be killing yourselves laughing. And then I'm going to start laughing. I'm not going to be able to stop. Okay. Okay. I won't. I won't. So everyone on mute. Okay. All right. Here we go. He has shown the... Oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, he has shown thee. Oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy god brilliant 
You know it, hey, right? You know, you know the song? Is that it? You it's, did fantastic. It's familiar. I, I, don't, I don't know why we didn't sing that one a lot. Maybe because it didn't repeat seven times. That's the, uh, that's the problem. Sadly, hey, if you oh, want. We got the... Yeah, if you want, I can... The... I, I can throw in like an encore if you'd like, you know, a brief, a I brief encore. That probably requires more money, right? Well, I mean, that was a pretty hefty, that was a pretty hefty super chat. I feel like oh, throwing one in okay. for free is. Uh... Look, Dr. Josh <laughs> yeah. wants to do it. He wants to. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. We need your... Hold on, here's the deal. You can't do it without your face. We got to see you, man. Uh, you got to be on uh, screen. Yeah. Uh, it, actually, it would be, it would be less effective, I think. <laughs> and you'll see why here in a moment. You want you okay. want to let people think, get that, get this in their imagination. And then um, when we're done with, okay. Are we, are we muting now? Are we muting? No, no, no. You can you, you can laugh it up. I, I'm not affected by it. <laughs> oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire <laughs> is so delightful. And since we've no place to go, <clears throat> let it snow. Let it snow. Let it snow. Okay. It doesn't show signs of stopping. And I brought me some corn for popping. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the lights are turned away down low. Let it snow. Um, let it snow. <clears throat> yeah, let it snow. Okay. I'm here to help. <laughs> Dude, you're, you're way too good. Oh, my God. Jeez. Have you ever been confronted by someone who follows um, his... What is his name? The younger creationist a guy uh can't hope dr dino yeah have you had anyone confront you about this at all ever i don't know and i don't know if you guys know this but i like i have a christmas album out in ken hogan's <laughs> voice did you know that no you don't are you serious <laughs> it's yeah maybe maybe one of the mods on the stream can go grab it uh it's on skylar fiction's channel and I think it's like a half hour long or more. It's like ten songs. I sing. Um, I sing. All I want for Christmas is you. <laughs> oh my gosh! It was. Uh, I did it. I did it for him, and uh, it was funny as hell. Uh, yeah, it was uh, trying to hit those high notes, man. And his voice was. Uh, it's pretty tough. <clears throat> wow! But I'm here to help. So, Thank you. oh man, Thank well, look, the... yeah, I wanted, I wanted to rock around ask... the Christmas tree. Sorry, hold on. I did think I did rock around the Christmas tree, and I also did uh, Blue Christmas. Uh, yeah, there's some good ones, there's some good ones in That's there. Awesome. So, <laughs> but here's the thing, too, right? And I know, I know you guys know what I'm talking about here, but if you've ever spent any amount of time in Christian ministry. You do. You need to at least be able to carry a tune, even just a little bit, because when you're up in front of the the congregation on on Sunday morning, or most particularly on Sunday evening, or on Wednesday nights when we used to get together, uh, you had to stand up there and you had to go through the hymn book and lead the people in the songs. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, especially those Sunday nights. I I swear it felt like. And I went to a, I went to a Baptist church as a kid, and we I mean we don't we don't sing like the the Pentecostals do, but Sunday nights I think we sang for half an hour. I don't know if this Nuts. is the link or not, but how do how do you guys feel about inviting uh, a Christian apologist on to talk about this infant sacrifice thing for a moment? Yeah, let's do it. I'm good. I probably have to jump. Uh, I was only okay. going to stay for about 15 or 20 minutes, but uh, uh, it, was, it was interesting. I probably don't have time to get caught up in another 20 or 30 minutes, and I suspect that's what it would take. But uh, yeah, Kip, yeah, I don't think yeah. Dr. Kip needs me uh, for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't either. But right. either way, it was good to have well, you here. Yeah, it's. Well, I Appreciate good you guys day. having me on, and thank you for good to see plugging you, man. the book like that. I appreciate. It. Gotta get the book. I mean, look, yes, I read it. Look, someone oh. asked me, "Have you not read the book?" Well, I, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly where to reference it because there isn't a specific 
in your contents, there's not a specific like infant sacrifice section. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's why I was asking. Yeah, yeah, Plus, yeah, yeah. I listened yeah, it to it on Audible like twice. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so definitely. And it's in, honestly, if there was going to be a place that you missed, like that would be it because it's in a very daddy, d- daddy, data heavy section uh, of archaeology. Yeah. So I'm unsurprised and certainly yeah. <laughs> unoffended. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely the the examples you go into of problems later that that's what really stands out. Your archaeology yeah. thing, imagining listening to it, it's not as easy as rememberable as you if you do later on. So yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you're talking about and then you dig down and this layer on top of that layer and mm-hmm. you hear this. It's not as uh, memory like the memory is yeah. not kicking in as good. So for yeah. sure. Well, let me uh, let me go ahead and tuck tail and run because I'm obviously okay. scared. I just want to let everybody know that I'm scared yeah, of whoever's yeah. coming in here. We know and it. I don't want to face any Christian apologists. So, you know, let's let's, let's, no. let's not mix words about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, okay. All right, guys. Love you, man. Thanks, Thanks See you, man. All right. Dr. Josh. Stay See you. So. Bye. Dude, he, so, he's awesome. Before we before we uh, bring the apologist on, I wanted to uh, absolutely everybody needs to go and buy uh, Dr. Josh's book if you haven't done so already. But if you've got some money left, uh, this is a good one. I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is by uh, Tom Stark. This is the Human Faces of God. What Scripture reveals when it gets God wrong and why inerrancy tries to hide it. Uh, Tom Stark was a student of uh, Christopher Rolston, who teaches at George Washington University. Brilliant, 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 brilliant guy. Um, mm. So, but uh, but his student Tom Stark uh, has has written what's a a very nice uh, user friendly book about some of these difficult topics from. Uh, the Hebrew Bible, and he he has a very uh, a very good one, a very good chapter in here on uh, human sacrifice in ancient Israel, titled "Making Yahweh Happy: Human hmm. Sacrifice in Ancient Israel." So, put that one on your book list, kids. It's a good one. All right, <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna share a link. This link is only, I repeat only for a christian who takes um a different stance than what you heard today who's trying to defend the god of the old testament that may be an apologist um if you'd like to come on and chat and say how we're wrong and and then you know go into that specific places let's say we're opening up the room to you if you're not a christian this isn't for you I don't want people who come on going, uh, Hey, I'm an ex Muslim or I'm a Muslim or what? Like none of that. None of that. That happened yesterday on Nathan's channel. And I'm not interested in that. This particular talk is for Christians who think everything Kip said is rubbish. And the God of the old Testament never took infant sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's for you opening up the room. I'll be able to filter anyway, one at a time, Kip. So if anyone who's a Christian, yeah. if you know an apologist who in particular does not agree with this position and they'd like to come on and, and discuss, send it to them. Um, we'll wait a little while. If nobody comes in that is a Christian apologist to defend their particular view, that's fine. We'll we'll wrap things up with uh, this uh, show. This has been a fantastic show, by the way. There's stuff we didn't get to get into that I really wanted to, um, maybe we can pop that up while we're waiting. Actually, I sent Dr. Josh sent me some stuff last night. I had a couple other people. I thought it was interesting. You brought up Josiah and the sacrificing of the enemies of Yahweh and at these different locations on their altars. Really interesting. Really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, what else is it? Joshua 11, 10 through 11 isn't infant sacrifice, but it's like annihilate everyone. Like man, woman, and child yeah. again. Like First yeah. Samuel fifteen, and somebody brought up somebody brought up the passage too. I noticed in in the side chat there at one point from uh, Leviticus chapter twenty seven, verses twenty eight to twenty nine, which again not a not a, a human sacrifice passage, but certainly a very very strong um, invective. Invet, yeah, 
yeah, invective or, or proscription to reinforce just how serious it is when you dedicate anything to mm. uh, to Yahweh. It's it's uh, what it's is that passage? Uh, Leviticus chapter twenty-seven, verses twenty-eight to twenty-nine. I'll read it. But of all that anyone owns, be it man or beast or land of his holding, nothing that he has proscribed for Yahweh may be sold or redeemed. Every proscribed thing is totally consecrated to Yahweh. No human being who has been proscribed can be ransomed. He shall be put to death. So, I mean, I, I said it's not it's not specific to human sacrifice in that that the uh, the word itself isn't used, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely the implication is definitely very clearly there within the text because anything that anything that's devoted or prescribed uh, to Yahweh interesting is, uh, yeah. is committed to death. So we went over Exodus 22 29 through 30, <clears throat> which is another one. the Ezekiel passage. Yeah, that one I got to bring that up. That Ezekiel 20, 25 through 26. That's a big one. All right. Ezekiel uh, 20, and it's 25 through 26. I wanted people to see this so they can kind of go, what the? All right. So let's go to 24 just to get above and then go below. I did this because they did not observe my regulations, they rejected my stat, my statutes. They desecrated my Sabbaths, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. So what did he do? He says, I also gave them decrees that were not good and regulations by which they could not live. I declared them to be defiled because of their sacrifices. They caused all their firstborn to pass through the fire so that I might devastate them so that they would know that I am the Lord. And I wonder, it sounds very... Um, kind of confusing here like is he so this is part of like it? this is part of the apologetic right um the 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 apologetic that ezekiel is uh implementing here is is a tacit recognition that yes child sacrifice human sacrifice is something that occurred within israel's history and yes child sacrifices and human sacrifices were offered to Yahweh. Um, and the explanation for this is exactly what follows. The people were so corrupt, they were so debased, they were so rebellious that Yahweh had no choice but to give them rules and laws and statutes that they could not possibly uh, live up to and made this, um, made, it, it's a way of, of, of almost ensuring that, uh, that they were uh, they were just completely abhorrent and and wicked. So here he's, I mean, in a sense, Yahweh is taking credit for the fact that these things happened in the past, but it's also an apologetic as to why. Mm. Um, you know, it was uh, it's the people's fault is is what's at the bottom line, and Yahweh allowed it to happen because he was so disgusted by them. Yeah, that's what really blew me away. When I saw that last night, <clears throat> I was like, yeah, this is pretty, it's telling. It's very telling. Um, yeah, and, there's uh, so I think there's, so there's another, yeah. Um, there's there, there's something else that's going on here with Ezekiel. Something that, that is important to recognize is that um, Ezekiel's writing, uh, part, part of what he's doing uh, within the Babylonian exile is is passing uh, judgment on uh, certain sources within the Mosaic Torah. Um, and then on the flip side, also showing how these have been replaced by the more perfect law of the Holiness Code in Leviticus, right? So... This is very much directly a challenge to the texts, like to the covenant code, to uh, the book of Exodus, where, or yeah, in, in Exodus chapter 22, where we read about uh, um, God's um, uh, instruction for human sacrifice. Ezekiel saying, yeah, that's there, and it's bad. And, 
And the reason it's bad is because, you know, the, the, the people were so corrupt. But then he's going to turn around and, and say, you know, there's a there's a better way. There's a better law. Look here in the in the holiness code. So, I mean, there's lots of stuff going on here. But one of the things we have preserved in the text is this 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 tension between texts and between traditions, between various theological camps um, throughout Israel's history, where there were disagreements and disputes mm -hmm. about uh, what we should be reading, what we should be doing. Now, we didn't get into one, one major example that <clears throat> usually, for whatever reason, goes right over our heads. We never even pay attention to it. And that is the Son of uh -huh. God. Yeah, yeah. Jesus himself as a human sacrifice. Now, a lot of scholars look at this and go, well, him dying wasn't on the plan. It wasn't on the calendar. So they fictitiously, if you will, write into the narrative of the Gospels that he's predicting his own death. And I think that this is clearly something worth looking at because <clears throat> my friend Jonathan M. S. Pierce, as we're doing the resurrection, we're going through the series right now. He points out in here, he's like, well, first of all, guys, just before we even get into this passage here or into this idea surrounding the death and resurrection of Jesus, like if he was saying all along to everybody while raising the dead and performing these miracles, hey, guys, I'm going to be killed and I'm going to come back from the dead. Don't you think everyone would have been waiting out there outside this tomb, like camping out, waiting for him to rise from mm -hmm. the dead? No, what you have is people run away in fear and women decide to go in and really uh, bring uh, fragrances and whatnot to the body. And on their way, you know, you, you start to wonder, is this a ad hoc or a post hoc um, solution of cognitive dissonance trying mm -hmm. to explain like this wasn't expected. Now we're writing a narrative after the fact. And we're going to search the scriptures to look for things like this, including that a sacrifice of God's son, his firstborn, is part of it. Does that play a role? Or is it possible that we kind of have a full through and through myth? Now, this is where both camps kind of come into the scene. Like yeah. It was written this way from the get-go, and it was understood this way from the get-go. So um, we do have someone in the chat. It's up to you. Oh, what do you want to do? You want to go for that? You want to pull up the uh, example? You want to go ahead and talk to our guest? Um, I don't. I don't think I need to say anything more about uh, about the example. But yeah, go ahead. Bring up the guest. Okay. I'm gonna. So, oh, all right. Here we go. Here we go. You're truly welcome. Please tell me you're a oh. Christian apologist. I'm a Christian. Yes. Okay. Good. Oh. Good. All right. Because so, you, I deal with this all the time, where people come on and they're not really so. Okay. Nope. No problem. What, your, what would you like to to say? I would like to to find out because uh, the title of the the topic is quite interesting. I would like to to give me one example where God uh, commands human sacrifice. Commands human sacrifice. Yeah, because this is the topic, right? Uh, human sacrifice in Israel. So mm -hmm. the title seems to suggest that uh, God uh, allows such uh, activities. So I would like to know where you get that information from. How would you approach that, uh, Dr. Kip? I would just say, I mean, I, I hope you were watching from the start, but Exodus chapter 22, verses 20, I don't know if you're reading in the, in the English or in the Hebrew, but um, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 22, verses uh, 29 to 30 in the English, is a, it's about as clear as it gets in the Hebrew Bible. One of the problems with this as, as Josh pointed out, as I've been trying to stress, is that um, we're approaching a text that already recognizes that this is something that took place in their history, and it's something that uh, they are they are editing and attempting to scrub out, um, and do so more successfully in some places than in others. So it's not going. I'm I'm pretty confident it's not going to be as explicit as you would hope yeah but that's 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 where it is and it's it's difficult to to read this passage as anything but an instruction that you should be offering your firstborn child as a sacrifice but it says uh first fruits right uh offer your firstborn and your, yeah. as a first fruit uh, the Lord benim, it's there okay. yeah right okay 
And not wh- just why do you first fruits, bechor banecha. Okay, so when it says do not, do not delay to offer, what what is the word in Hebrew for offer here? Uh, it's natan, but uh, to give. And I would I would suggest, yeah, you're right. This is not this is not zavach. This is not hula. Um, this is not even haram. Okay. Um, and I would I would submit that uh, that it's uh, this this might be part of the process of scrubbing. But I think within the context, if you read the entire thing, starting okay. in verse uh, verse twenty nine, and and make sure you read verse thirty two as well. Okay. Twenty nine and thirty. You're supposed okay. to give what? Your vats, your storehouses, your firstborn of son, of your course. cattle, your sheep. Okay, and again, I'm trying to figure out why you're saying that when it says to offer, it means to sacrifice. I need to know where you're making that correlation. Can you give me any other example where that same word is used and meaning to offer uh, as a sacrifice? Natan? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't know. I'd have to look it up. Okay, but the, the context here, you went, because all the scripture says and, and that he's against that. He actually, in Deuteronomy 1, all the way to mm-hmm. four, he's telling the people uh, uh, to not do the same thing as the Canaanites because they offer their children to, to their gods. Yeah, by the so time, he's, he's, by the time, by the time the book of Deuteronomy was written, yes, there is a clear recognition that this is something that uh, was no longer to be practiced. The point is that there was a time in Israel's history, and this is pretty clear from from the fragments that continue to exist within the text. Okay. And from you know the understanding that Israel is an ancient Near Eastern uh, culture, just okay. like the surrounding ancient Near Eastern cultures, the the implication here is that this is something that that, that was common that took place that people were absolutely familiar with, okay, and so that me, people performed human you, sacrifices to Yahweh. Let me okay. ask you this: in in Judges eleven, okay, okay. Jethro's daughter. Like, what do you think happened there? I mean, obviously, a lot of Christians don't want to accept that there, Jetha actually sacrifices his daughter as a vow he made to the Lord, Yahweh. Nowhere in that text did he say, you know, hey, no, this isn't going to go down because I did this with Abraham and that's been long over with. But Jetha follows through with the vow. Now, me nor Dr. Kip believe this is historical. None of us, like, actually believe that this... This is this might be a remnant of an idea of things like that, but we don't say this literally happened. Jeff literally went and conquered 20 cities because of the vow he made to the Lord. And next thing you know, he's got to sacrifice his daughter. Do you think he sacrificed his daughter according to this narrative in Judges 11? I I, I would accept it, but what I will also add to that is that it was not commanded by God. So that's that's my whole point. I know there were sacrifices, human sacrifices in Israel. What does it mean for uh, for someone to give their vats, their storehouses, their firstborn child, their cattle, and their sheep to you? To uh, what does it say specifically here? To Yahweh, if, to if you're to familiar, Yahweh. if you're familiar with the law of God, uh, you can go to Proverbs where it says, uh, "Offer your." Why are we uh, reading Proverbs? Because they're about to what give does Proverbs explanation. Have to do with this. Because they're explaining, they're explaining what that means. If you're gonna need, uh, understand, to okay. So you don't want to go to Proverbs. Let's go. Uh, let's go oh, to. Go ahead. Um, go ahead and read it, but it has nothing to do with this. Okay. So, so repeat your question, because I want to make sure. Go ahead. I want to know what you. I know. I want to know what this means. To give uh, that your means... your vats, your storehouses, your firstborn child, your cattle, and your sheep to you. Okay. That means uh, we uh, accept the fact that God has blessed us, and He said. If you don't want to go to, to, to Proverbs, we can go to when uh, Abraham gave 10% of all of his, uh, everything that God provided for him, all the blessings okay, so he bestowed is, upon him. In, in, in practical terms, what does it mean to give those things to Yahweh? Well, to give what it to Yahweh, work? in a practical sense, you give it to Yahweh. Yeah. And those, uh, all of these things are given or uh, could be uh, uh, used for temple service. Or given to the Levites, because the Levites have no inheritance except for what we provide for them. So all of the 11 tribes are supposed to give their 10% for temple service and for the Levites. So when we give a sacrifice, the Levites would eat that meat. That's one 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 of the purposes 
of giving your uh, 10% or your uh, firstborn or uh, basically that's what it, it amounts to. So basically we would provide our 10% uh, for temple service and for uh, sustaining the Levites because they had no inher so, inheritance. That's in context. So in you want to go to Proverbs. In the, in the passage, you know, go ahead and read the Proverbs thing. That's fine. No, no, no problem. It, I, 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 it, it, it comes to the same thing. It comes to the same thing. So technically you're saying the sheep and oxen in verse 30 of Exodus 22 here. Yes. You're saying um, that is, you're open to saying that's a, that's giving that as sacrifice to the temple. Are those sacrifices? They could, they could serve as sacrifices for the temple. They could serve as okay. burnt offerings, peace offerings. Um, there's many different types of offerings and as food for the Levites. Yeah. So I'm but interested to know where you where you distinguish within the text itself that this is any different than offering the bechor benaka. Well, what do you mean by that? Uh, you, you can say it in English for the people but of the, who are but, not familiar. But the bechor benaka. Oh yeah, the first born, your... your firstborn son. Okay, my my point is uh, when it says firstborn son, it's a, an offering to God for temple service because there were people who were uh, dedicated. For temple service, for example, Samuel was dedicated for temple service, a service yeah, from birth. We talked about him. So, Truly, okay, let so, me ask you, let me ask so, you this so my way. point, my point is, you in, not, you cannot provide me any example where God, because uh, you're you're interpreting Exodus twenty two to make it seem like it's a, 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 a child sacrifice, but you cannot uh, substantiate that through scripture. So this is something you, you have to isolate it and come with your own. Okay. Um, Abraham, right? What, yes. what, what was he about to do to Isaac and God was doing that? Now, I know at the end of the story, I know yeah. we all know he pulls out at the end. Guy, ah, all right, I just wanted to see your faithfulness. Yeah. What would be the point of that? I mean, like, is it not a thing that people were sacrificing humans? And here you have him about to sacrifice the most valuable thing. In fact, his firstborn son. It, it, and I, here you have exactly. this in Exodus. How far of a leap is it to see that his firstborn being offered to God? this idea that he's willing to sacrifice him to God in Abraham's story, how, how far of a leap? I mean, do you see, do you at least see why we see these things this way? Even if you interpret them as something else, cause you don't like the idea or you say, sorry, I just don't accept that my God would yeah. be willing to do that. And that's okay. I understand if that's where you fall, okay. but do you see at least why we see it that way? Why we think that this might be something there? Uh, here's the issue contextually and uh, linguistically, you cannot, come uh, with this approach. Why? And you have Dr. Kip here. You have uh, Dr. Kip there. He could help you with the word. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to do it. Uh, he could mm. tell you linguistically the word o, Ola. Know. The word Ola doesn't mean sacrifice. Uh, so God, I'm saying what God said. God didn't say uh, sacrifice your son. He said provide him as a stairway or an ascension. It could mean sacrifice. Yeah. or no. The word Ola means ascension according to every Hebrew uh, lexicon. Your, your doctor, you should know that. Uh, according to heaven, we, we could do it right now. We could do it right now. Uh, Derek, you could put it on the screen. Uh, Ola means. Uh, I'll the, let Kip the, pull it up. Kip can pull it up since pull he's. Pull it up. Put it up. Sure. Uh, real if, quick. if I'm lying, if I'm lying, then uh, I, I will uh, concede the point. But Ola means ascension, stairway. I so appreciate the super chat as well Pegasus. as ascension. That's the this, that that is the primary silly, definition. This silly primary. wooden literal understanding of the usages of words is is unhelpful. I'm giving you nonsense. I'm giving you the definition, the primary definition of the word according to every Hebrew lexicon. The primary, the primary, the primary definition of the word is not the definition that occurs in every context. Okay, so 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 you're going with your context. I I didn't even elaborate my on my position. It is your context because it's not mine. Because I'm telling you that it doesn't mean sacrifice. It means ascension, stairway. And I could add to that because uh, Abraham says, uh, Isaac says to his, son, uh, to his father, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Yahweh himself appears, will appear as a sheep, according to the word ra'ah, according to the Hebrew. When you use uh, the word ra'ah in relation to God, as per Genesis 11, 5, it means God himself will appear. Or you can go to Genesis 18 again, Yahweh Ra'ah appeared. So, and when we go to John 8, Jesus says, before I was, uh, before Abraham was, I am. 
and and he says um he says what he says and abraham saw me saw my day and he rejoiced so abraham understood that the sacrifice that god provided on, in genesis 22 was a representation of the son of god who is the one who will present himself as a sacrifice and when you go to job 933 we see that also uh being um demonstrated where it says uh according to the uh to job 933 who can be an intercessor between me a stairway between me and god and could hold both our hands so again my i could uh my interpretation is totally consistent with all of the scriptures i just provided john, job 933 john 8 and uh genesis 11 5 and genesis 18. all right so let dr let kip give us some thought here and uh i mean i'm I wonder if I can enter reading mode on this one. No, I can't. Um, in the uh, in the right top tab here, can you see this? Where it says "Ola," it is the very first definition of the word. The primary definition of the word sacrifice, which is holy burned. What was the primary? What was the number one definition? Because you, you didn't say it. you Sacrifice, went to the second one. Which no, but the first one, burned. the one that the one that you didn't read, the one that you didn't read. What was the first one? You want the me to read definition? the whole thing here? No, Allah no, the stairway. Allah. Okay, it's not there. Oh, it this doesn't is say the stairway. There? Definition of the noun. No. Uh, uh, what the uh, what the uh, lexicon is this? Because uh, what are, what are you this what are we looking low. at right this here? This is the this is the standard scholarly lexicon for the Hebrew Bible. I never heard of it. Uh, according to you've never other, heard of uh, halot. You've no, never, never heard, heard of halot. It. No, I don't. I never heard. Well, of it. who are you? This is okay, this is a this is so a you're saying this resource it, buddy. This is okay. This is what every scholar in the field uses. No problem. When they're no problem. when they're reading Hebrew, are you telling me it, so, it can never mean stairway? Because no, if I'm I give not you saying that at all, okay, okay. So what are you saying? You. you said the primary definition of the word was stairway. According to Bible Hub, incorrect. Strong, Bible Hub, you're strong, reading strong the Bible Hub and strong Strong's It's not good Strong's enough. Concordance? No, it's okay. absolutely not. No it's problem. A, that's a resource no from. We'll give you the. What, we'll give you the, the benefit of that. Through the 19th century, so I'm not gonna we'll stop. We'll give you the benefit. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt, but uh, can you add layers Good. that I just said when it says Abraham said Yahweh himself Ra'a would appear as a sheep? Can, can you explain to me that part? Because I'm adding layers to it to show you that it was not, it didn't mean uh, sacrifice, it means a stairway. Uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5 Who has ascended or descended? What is his name and the name of his son? A stairway, a connection between the, uh, the divine and the earth. My my interpretation is totally consistent with all the passages I just provided to you. Genesis eleven five. Let us uh, uh, it says uh, ra'a using the word ra'a and saying that he saw and he came down. So the word ra'a when it's applied to God means means him coming down. So how can you uh, in light of the fact that Abraham says he would be that sacrifice? Um, how can you say that? How can you say that God was uh, asking Abraham to sacrifice his son when God was this providing is, a sacrifice himself? Himself. This is a circular nonsense. It's context. It's, esoteric, it's context. metaphoric appeal to the text. It's not context. It's I give you five verses. I give you the uh, Genesis, Genesis eleven five. I think Derek, I used, Derek. I think I think the audience can clearly see what's going on here, and I I will leave. I will leave them to judge. No problem. Um, what's no going problem. on? No it, problem. Uh, the way, and and you can see it here. The way, the way to twist yourself out of these uh, these predicaments with a text that clearly indicates not just the presence of human sacrifice in ancient Israel, but the advocation okay. of human sacrifice in ancient Israel to Yahweh. The only way to get around it is to invent these bizarre, twisted, metaphoric uh layers in order to apply to the biblical text and not just to sit down and read the text for it but uh, we asked you for example ex exodus 22 that you said means sacrifice i was asking for a, uh, an example you didn't provide one yet i'm, well, I'm not going contextually to again one because I again have contextually for you but contempt 
I have nothing for I, you. But I, I do agree with that part. I do agree. You finally yes. said the truth. You yeah. finally said the truth. But you it's lied to your. your and but I Exodus have, twenty two. No you have no. You have no example. You, you have no. No problem. Exodus twenty two. You have uh, no example that it means contextually oh. sacrifice. So you lied about that. And Exodus eighteen, I gave you five or six verses that clearly establishes that it has nothing to do with sacrifice. You said it doesn't mean stairway. First, you say it doesn't mean stairway. Then I, I was about to provide you an example, and then, oh, oh, it might mean it. So if it might mean it, why doesn't it mean it in Exodus eighteen, uh, Genesis eighteen? Because that's not what you I'll want. Let, I'll let my work stand. No problem. Merits. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Everybody knows what's going on here. No Truly, problem. Truly uh, appreciate you coming on no as problem. a Christian and coming with Thank a different you. perspective. And uh, like I said, it'd be cool to have other apologists come on. I'll send the chat. Have a nice day, sir. Take care. Take care. All right. So um, I'm going to go ahead and send out the link again. If someone is interested in, uh, in they're a Christian apologist and uh, I'd like to join. I'm going to wrap things up here soon, ladies and gentlemen. So Christians only who would like to come in but while we do that please uh tell us what you think about the situation here dr kip with uh seven day week guy yeah i just i have no time for uh for that so guy. you're acquainted you're familiar he, he, with with he talks circle and he talks nonsense I've, I've seen him around a little bit so and i hope everybody can see what he's doing um and this is why i'm i'm such a strong proponent and an advocate for sitting down and just carefully reading the text instead of attempting to invent these these bizarre esoteric ways of of uh it's it's a form of gnosticism really where you you have to you have to code the text and you have to code it with 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 words and metaphors in order to change the plain meaning of what's there in the text into something that that, that soothes your own your own ego or your own ideals about who you think God is and what you think this this book is about. I think it's pretty clear. Well, you know, something interesting that I, I want to say thank you, Constellation Pegasus, for the super chat. I just typed it out I as mean, well. So uh, I think I think it's important to note here too. Just just sorry, Derek, to interrupt you once more. You're fine. The fact that this guy is coming into an argument or or coming into a scholarly dis discussion with Bible Hub and Strong's Concordance says everything you need to know about the quality of his own work. The standard reference within biblical within uh, biblical literature for the Hebrew Bible. There's two books actually. There is one that is the Hebrew Aramaic Lexicon of the Old Testament, otherwise known as Kolot. And if you spend any amount of time in the field, you know what this book is. The other mm -hmm. one is known as BDB. This is Brown Driver Briggs's uh, lexicon to the Hebrew Bible. It's it's still a good resource, but it's about a hundred years old, which is why there is now Halot, which is a massive tome. It it exists in in a couple of volumes, um, and yeah. So I yeah. will repeat: I have nothing but contempt for him. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the, if you listened carefully, how he was describing Genesis 18, he was anachronistically I listing. Well, I, I, I know you did. That's why I was yeah. like, I know you were, you were looking at something else, focused on something else and, and really not even interested in the, in the discussion, but he was doing the interpretation as I did as a Christian of Genesis 18. Really the sacrifice was God himself. Hint, hint, Jesus. You see like in the context of Genesis 18, no, there's not a Jew on planet Earth. There's not a Hebrew scholar who's actually Old Testament that interprets that as if this is a Jesus. Uh, this is actually Jesus, right? Unless it's a Christian who believes this to be, oh, well, God will send himself, meaning his own self being the sacrifice, Jesus. This is something that I'm seeing that the anachronism here is starting with what the Bible in the New Testament says, mm -hmm. going to the Old Testament, interpreting it that, that way. But even then... I do find it interesting. He's going to go sacrifice his son. It's okay. We're still going to do a human sacrifice. It'll be my son in a couple thousand years. So yeah. the human sacrifice thing is still there. It's no matter how you want to slice this human sacrifice is still the point. Blood needs to be drawn. And it's not this pretty Ascension esoteric understanding. It must be blood. 
and it must be gruesome and a life must be taken. So what we're really dealing with originally is the idea of infant. Is there child sacrifice? Is there something of a remnant there? We see it with like, no, 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 the through the flames of Molech, if you will. These are no-nos, but then Ezekiel gives the hint uh, yeah. that we were talking about earlier, that there's like, yeah. hey, you guys were doing this thing. Because you were disobeying, I kind of gave you over to these things where you're going to sacrifice your own children and whatnot. Clearly a situation, too, where someone is grappling with these problematic issues presented within the text themselves and not coming to a, a, a bizarre, idiotic conclusion such as, such as the one that uh, that uh, seven-day week guy was, was attempting to, to provide. So, yeah, sorry. Got a no, little... No, it's... Uh, I, look, I just... I'm just inviting. Just, I'm people. sorry, it just pissed me off. Yeah, so, I understand. My apologies, understand. everyone. I understand, but um, yeah, I guess nobody else wanted to hang out and come and harass you. Uh, <laughs> you got to give him some credit. You know, he came to uh, yeah, harass you, no, right? I'm. He's yeah. He's he's a brazen guy. Um, yeah, but now I don't I don't, I don't know. know too much uh about it but i i know that he came on talking about the seven day thing and that we're all under the submission of this god that holds the seven day week or something like that and um dr josh and others were just like no like no this is not the case and and it's just something that i guess you have to know, you have to go with your bible you have to be like like this is my book and there's nothing else I'm going to really consider as evidence to support the claim, I guess on that whole thing. But yeah, most of our audience doesn't know what the point was. So, there's a seven day week argument he makes or something. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I thought too, I just wanted to, to, to reemphasize again. I think you made an important point there. Um, and I really hope this is something that, uh, that people take to heart, whether you agree with me or not about this issue um i hope you can recognize that the the simple straightforward reading of these texts will lead people to the conclusions that i and mainstream scholarship are continuing to draw about these issues within the text so just because we're not jumping through the hermeneutical hoop sorry the hermeneutical hoops that you've erected for us doesn't mean that we haven't we haven't thought through these issues it's 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 abundantly clear to us yeah i guess um exodus 22 29 through 30 uh that that does make a lot of sense here and i um i was thinking to myself when the conversation was happening like if it doesn't mean this, then what does it actually mean? And if it's just, well, just uh, every firstborn male is going to be working in the temple. Well, we know the Levites did that, but is this addressing only Levites in Exodus? Like where, where, it's, where do you draw the line on that? I don't know. And this is know. where, I mean, it, it's such a complicated issue in large part because you've got a, a, a combination of sources at work. So it's, you know, something that scholars are not going to do is just ham fistedly, draw from any part within the Bible to make a point about another part of the Bible. Yeah. Um, there's what we have preserved here is a record of conflict and tension. These are, these are texts that are in conversation with one another and at various points in disagreement with one another. So yes, in, uh, in certain contexts, the Levites were present in uh in the tabernacle and maybe in the temple although there's uh there's there's other texts which indicate that that's not necessarily the case so this is this is part of what makes it extremely difficult um when approaching this issue because you've got so many voices weighing in on uh, on what's going on interesting I just sent out one more little thing in case they were trying to uh, jump on, and come on in here and say, hey, and give their thoughts. But uh, yeah, I, I do appreciate it. This has been a wonderful episode with tons and tons of insight. Uh, I sent out the link if you guys wanted to pop in there for a second. While you're doing that, if you decide to, feel free. 
I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you guys this real fast. Dr. Kip's YouTube channel. I, Hold on, this this is probably a good good place to uh, to finish up because I'm I'm going to have to get get running here. But uh, okay. But yes, this has been very fun. Well, I do appreciate it, man. Um, we've got uh, Kip's YouTube channel. Also, Dr. Josh's book and his YouTube channel, ladies and gentlemen. I really do appreciate that. we got the Patreon with all the videos, tons and tons of videos. My homegirl, Darlene, all of these people, different scholars, PhDs, New Testament, Old Testament, you name it. Um, thank you, Constellation, for the super chat. Isn't this complicated only because the shock of it all shakes us up? Yeah, that's a good thank point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Do you have do you have just a couple more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Stop the op. Be. Welcome to Myth Vision, man. Are you a Christian apologist? Um, I believe in God. Does it count? I, I <laughs> dude, there's so many people Am who I? believe in God, uh, man. No. Um no, well, well, look, 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 hey, look. Yeah. All right. So um, well, my whole th I mean, I don't really necessarily believe in the idea of like a messiah or some blood temple ritual sacrifice or any of that, you know, but I do believe in God. I do believe things, you know, are, are a little bit too perfect and aren't really as they seem. I, I don't know if that puts me in the category, but I kind of just wanted to touch on some of the stuff the last guy was saying, because honestly, I've been at this whole debate. Uh, a good friend of mine, he is a Christian, and I bring up the whole point of child sacrifice in the Old Testament. And um, but that last guy brought up brought up a couple interesting points. I mean, going going uh towards the uh what was it what was that word uh that you guys were kind of dissecting there he thought it meant stairway you were saying to me what was that word hola can i explain this maybe i can help to explain yeah yeah touch on touch here. on that a little so, because because I, yeah. yeah go ahead okay so i mean just like in english just as in any other language um there is uh there are synonyms there are words and 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 words themselves will have a multitude of meanings um, in this case, in Hebrew, the word uh, from which burnt offering comes from is uh, a verbal root, Allah, which means to go up or to ascend. The noun form, uh, and we clearly recognize the nouns themselves because of how they're pointed and how they're pronounced. The noun form most often means whole burnt offering. There are places within the text where it can mean an ascent or a stairway um, because it's derived from the same verbal root. So this is where context is exceptionally important when understanding what, the, what these words are about. So, and, and it's, not that, it's not that difficult to make the determination between when the text is describing a stairway or when it's describing a whole burnt offering. It's pretty straightforward. And now what, what this guy was going on about was just because it means uh, stairway in this context, that must mean that I can take it and apply it over in this other context and have it mean exactly the same thing. I mean, there's nothing technically within the language that prevents you from doing that, but you're going to misunderstand the intent of the author if that's something you're going to do universally throughout. Does that make sense? Yeah, I feel like, yeah, it definitely makes sense. I mean, I feel like, unfortunately, that's the kind of weird thing about translations and how you have, you know, uh, different languages going to other languages and, and then that. But did you have any other uh, examples, just so I could bring up to my buddy, of uh of places where this word was used in the same context that you were talking uh in exodus 22 hola well actually so the word itself hola does not appear in exodus 22 and the problem with exodus 22 and this is something that he's he's getting at and what he's alluding to and he's correct about this it does not explicitly say sacrifice your firstborn son the text does not say that. What the text does say is it says your vats, your storehouses, your firstborn son, your sheep, and your cattle, give them to Yahweh. That's all it says. The implication of this, though, and within the context of the, uh, of, of the covenant code where it occurs, is that these are to be presented to Yahweh as sacrifices 
And I, I got into this a little bit in my in my talk earlier, but one of the reasons we're we're quite confident about this is because of the whole theory of sacrifice um, that that was dominant within the ancient Near East. The way that something transferred from the mortal realm into the divine realm was by literally passing through the fire or by being killed. Um, you would pour the oil out on the altar and around the altar. It's, it's a form of transference. So the way that you give these things to Yahweh, the most straightforward, simple, practical uh, understanding of what's happening in this passage is that these are things that are offered and reserved as sacrifice. And hey, quick question! Quick, hey, quick question yeah. before I sign out. Quick question. Sure. Hey, where does uh, if that, if that comes back to uh, burnt offering, where does uh, the term Holocaust and it coming back to burnt offering? How does that uh, tie up? Uh, so I mean, there's you can kind of hear it in the uh, in the term itself, right? Holocaust. The, uh, uh, the burnt okay. offering is a hola. Okay, I mean Holocaust. I, as far as I know, I don't think it that. that specific word itself is is something that, uh, that occurs in the hebrew bible but yeah that's that's what um you that you're yeah because it, right it means uh, it, yeah it means it means burn yeah. off and i'll just you know hey yeah, just, okay. just signing off there hey hey signing off though myth vision uh, first time I've, I've only tuned into you the last like couple weeks i received that interview with adam green man much love keep it up all right boys thanks for checking us out and coming on and chatting Thank you. And friendly. appreciate it man so, um, yeah, Dr. Kip, thanks for coming on. And very interesting, very interesting discussion. Maybe we'll plan it. And what we can do is uh, I've got some apologist friends. We could potentially say, would you be interested? Right. I've got some uh, guys like uh, maybe we can get uh, what's his name? Michael. What's his name? Help me out here. Oh, the uh, Heiser? No, no, no. He's sick right now. He's got cancer. He's been struggling fighting cancer right now. Um, he's got the big YouTube channel too. My buddy, uh, Inspiring Philosophy. Uh, Michael, oh, Michael Jones. Yeah. Michael Jones. Yeah. We'll see if Jones would come on or um, how he would interpret uh, this, right? Because obviously he's he probably, might be. Yeah. He's probably still not talking to me though. So. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot about that. Damn. Um, maybe we can get um, Jonathan McClatchy or um, someone else because I'm friends with Jonathan on Facebook. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, look, some apologists. I, I'd like to get heavy hitters. I'd love to see some big, you know, sure. apologist guys come on. But and I, you know, I one of the one of the big problems. I'm going to repeat this. It's it's the the apologists can come back and always point to as uh, as we saw in the Exodus chapter 22 passage. Um, if you're extremely wooden and literal in your approach to the text, you can make it say certain things that will align with your point of view. Um, if you if you hold to a position that uh, that maintains the perfect unity of the test of, of the text, you can you can work your way through. Um, uh, these 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 complicated arguments about how well you know yes human sacrifice or child sacrifice is something that occurred but it's never something that that Yahweh explicitly you know said go and do this or it's never something that it's presented as something that he's he's specifically happy about um, but uh, you know it takes it takes a, a more sophisticated reader than that to to you know correctly and and appropriately appreciate and understand what's going on here i mean if you take in if we're going to jump through context right think about this if you take first samuel 15 all right and you were to say uh saul didn't kill all the amalekites every man woman and child and god was mad that he didn't actually do what he was supposed to do yeah. and let's just interpret exodus 22 to mean what you say in the time in which it's going on, do they think God is going to be mad for not being obedient and giving your firstborn son? 
if God commands you to give your first fruits and to give this and to give the cattle firstborn and the sheep, whatever, and your firstborn son, you know, if that picture of God is somehow harmonized in your head and we understand he's mad that you didn't do this over here in Samuel, annihilate yeah. every man, woman and child of the Amalekites. But then you get over here and it's like sacrifice your firstborn. You disobey that. Is he happy that you didn't do what he told you to do? No, he'd be angry. And to appease the hungry God that loves the smell and the aroma, you know, that's that's something to consider. A couple super yeah. chats and I'll let you go, man. All I right. know this is off topic, but since Dr. Kip is here, did the Kum, uh, Kumranians <laughs> think they were coming back or did they leave Dead Sea Scroll for posterity? I think I think Smoke's probably probably asking here. the The prevailing theory is that uh, the people who wrote and collected the Dead Sea Scrolls hastily deposited them in caves and ran because uh, the Romans were were coming and uh, and wiping everything out in front of them. Um. So I think, and I I would say, yeah, I I would think they they probably expected that they were coming back. Um, even if they weren't, I don't think that leaving the text there for posterity was first and foremost in their minds either. Uh, I, I think it was just, um, yeah, it was just the hope that, uh, that they would all survive. I don't know if that answers your question, but, uh, yeah. we can talk about that another time. Okay. And then last one. Um, oh, sorry. Here we are. Constellation Pegasus. I've said this time and time again. If God exists, why can't he have books written? We can all understand. Makes no sense. I don't know if it's yeah, uh, you if know, you, it's sorry. It's problematic if you have to go to that much work to uh to to get the to get the right understanding of what's in the text. Isn't it, folks? Hmm. I find it ironic that Marcion like I, I keep coming back to him. He's someone mm. I, I went to bed last night thinking about how I need to research more about this guy and how they just said no to the old Testament God. And yeah. you got to ask yourself why, even at the end of the day, you said, all right, I do. I can't, I just can't accept this. What you're saying about human sacrifice, all of the other data that we, that that's there. That's ugly. That's all in Dr. Josh's book on the old Testament, mm -hmm. the atheist handbook. And uh, countless other books talk about this stuff. Like, why did Marcion realize this is not a God of love? This is not the God of Jesus. That's the whole point mm -hmm. he's trying to make is that this can't be my God, right? He can't accept it. It's like too much. So yeah. Christians should maybe ask themselves that question, even though Augustine and later church fathers said, no, 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 we're going to make sure it's both. You know, we, we've got to have both yeah. here. Yeah. You know, it's it's uh, it's interesting too, and this is a little bit besides the point. But we probably have Marcion to thank, in the end, for just the very existence of a Christian canon. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I've seen it, I've seen it written, I've seen it said, I've taught this that uh, the canon, the the act of forming a canon of text, a a limited list of things that you find acceptable to be reading in your churches is a reactionary behavior. So what's going on here is that uh, Marcion has sort of thrown the gauntlet down to start with and said, we need to, we need to, to formulate a list of texts here. And the church is responding to that by basically coming in and, and, and putting their own together. So, I agree. Yeah, if it weren't for him being so contentious or such a who knows, who yeah. knows what our Bibles would look like today if not for Marcion. Ooh, that's a good note to end. <laughs> what a place ladies to end, eh? Wait, what a great <laughs> way, ladies and gentlemen. Seriously, appreciate you. Uh, all of the comments, all of the chat. Uh, I appreciate our guests no, thanks, everyone. on, huh? I, I just said thanks, everyone. That was yeah. I appreciate you, of course, coming on and spending the time. Go subscribe to Dr. Kip's channel. I really yeah. appreciate everybody who's helped with this. The, the, like I said, the guest, even the one you disagree with at the end of the day, yeah. who thinks that we're all under the seven-day week slave uh, of this God who's like controlling and all that stuff. 
Um, I do appreciate him, though. I, I thank and, everybody who popped on. And uh, till next time, we'll do another chat. Doc, Dr. Josh and I will be uh, will be heading to the studio together in the in the near future to record our our uh, album. Our, our own greatest right. hits album. So that's right. We can have for that. Yeah, I can't wait to hear you sing. <laughs> oh man, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Now off you to bet, the gods. Man. Thanks, everyone. Next time. <laughs>